and welcome to our very first episode of Cryptid Ramblers. I'm Scott, living in Southend, and uh, across the screen from me, we have Callum in Basildon. Hello, hello. Sorry. Right, um, the purpose of this podcast is to uh, research and investigate cryptid creatures from across the world in scientific forms, in folklore forms, and uh, what way to start then the world's biggest cryptid? Arguably, absolutely. Arguably the biggest, yeah, the yeah. big man himself, Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought so, you know, start start with the big guy. You know, he's, he's definitely the uh, you know the most famous. Um, I would think anyway. You know, you mentioned Bigfoot. Everyone knows. You know, whether it's from the folklores and the legends, as you've said, or, you know, whether it's down to Harry and the Hendersons that was on TV years ago, which that. was a great show, by the way. Um, everyone, uh, just, everyone you're talking knows. about Harry and the Hendersons, mate, I genuinely, as a kid, I genuinely thought Harry was a real Bigfoot. Oh, yeah, mate, I'm not everyone kidding. would have. It's only, it's only when you learn, when you know better, <laughs> <laughs> that you realise that that is a guy in a suit. <laughs> but, you know, you've, even if... Even if you was out there and you did see a guy in a suit and it was the Harry and the Henderson suit, you would freak. Like you would believe that it was, it was so good the way the mouth moved, the fur, the yeah. No, I mean, yeah, that, that's <laughs> anyone, anyone would believe that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Chew his older brother. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right. <laughs> yes, with uh, I understand yeah. you've done some real deep research into the yeah. whole Certainly Big tried. The Yeti Sasquatch thing. Yeah, I wanted to do a bit of a, yeah, I wanted to do a bit of a, you know, deep dive on it as, as much as possible. It, it, you know, like we said before the recording, it, it does get to a point where you do have to stop what you're kind of researching because it is just endless. The, the, you know, everyone's got different stories, different accounts. You know, I think almost every every state in America has got its own legend or or someone who has a, you know, a story that they wholly believe in and you could quite easily research each one you know and you've got you know um asia uh canada you know which is uh obviously the sasquatch yeah. um you know so many different places around the world that have got their own you could, you could literally deep dive into each one and have a completely different origin and different evidence and so it's just um yeah it's it's nuts much like yourself i had to i had to be disciplined and, and stop at some point because yeah. it was just nuts yeah I mean, we're we're gonna we're gonna explore as many aspects of the Bigfoot legend or myth, yeah, definitely. Or, you know, yeah, that's the thing. It's you know, for it some people, it's going to remain a myth. You know, I think there are some stories that I've looked into that does add some credibility. Um, you know, to the you know to the legend and, and to the story. Some are quite out there, um, and that's open I've to quite a few that's those, just open so. to belief, really. Yeah. Um, some are scientific, which again, it's just whether you choose to, you know, believe it or not. Um, you know, everyone's about believing the science at the moment, so it'll be interesting to see yeah. how, how yeah. you know how this goes. But um, yeah, it's just to look into the myth, look into the possibility of it being real. You know, not trying to add any kind of any real opinion one way or another. Really, just kind of enjoy talking it out, and, and yeah. see we kind of end up at the end. I think I know yeah. what side of the fence. I sit on at the moment, um, but it'll be interesting to see whether that changes at the end of, you know, at the end of the episode. Absolutely, um, and then I, I'm going. I was about to say exactly the same thing because we, I think we agree, really, on what mm. on what we've what we think Bigfoot is. Yes, what we surmise I it believe so. Be. Yeah, um, and it will be. It, yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether or not because I I don't know a hundred percent of what you've researched i don't know what you've looked into and mm. and vice versa well, so, likewise yeah i don't know yeah yeah i mean i've i've mostly taken the british stuff um yes. as there's over like 500 confirmed sightings of big yeah which is surprising um, some close to us in essex which I, oh, yeah. I didn't even know until recently well until researching for this yeah i had no idea about it and it's, that's when i thought right okay i'm gonna go a little bit deeper into this but i <laughs> went down a rabbit hole Oh, mate, as ridiculous. you always do with these sort of things, and it went really weird. So I oh, just I thought let's step back a little bit yeah. and present a couple of cases. Yeah, definitely. And uh, then yeah. I suppose it's up to you guys as well. Anyone that's listening or anyone watching, listening, uh, yeah, 
if anyone is. <laughs> if anyone is, yeah, please do. <laughs> then, uh, yeah, please comment. Yeah, we want, your, <laughs> yeah, we want anyone else's do. kind of thoughts and theories and yeah. whether they think we're talking well, hogwash or... missed as well. Yeah. If there's anything which, that we've missed, anything which that absolutely, you absolutely There is bound to be. There is absolutely mm-hmm. bound to be stuff that we've not even kind of touched on or stuff that we've overlooked or things that we might even mention and we didn't dive into enough. And there might be someone out there who's a you know expert in that that wants to to kind of share. Um, oh, yeah. Let's make that apparent. We are not experts in this. Absolutely not. No, just a huge fan of the the myth and the legend. And yeah, I know I know no more than what anyone else could if you did the research, yeah. watch the hours of documentaries and YouTube videos. So yeah, by no means. Uh, We're just two experts with access to computers. That's all that we are. Pretty much just two nerds who can get on the internet, basically. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. (laughs) That is more or less. (laughs) That is more or less it. So, um, yeah. So I I assume, as we as we said earlier, most people by now will know, or have at least heard the legend of um, of Bigfoot. Um, But as as I mentioned as well, it's in in Canada. It's known as Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. Bigfoot was penned um, in America actually um i think it was as as recent actually as the 50s Uh, i think 1958 um was when the phrase was was coined it was literally because the picture that the article was based on was of a big foot you know there's no nothing clever behind it It, you know is as um as simple as that um you know i think in terms of what the world knows I, i think i'd be fairly confident in saying that the legend did sort of start from from america and from those initial from those initial sightings there are accounts of you know right back to like the 1830s that i think um yes. kind of mention a version of uh, maybe even predating that um but for all intents and purposes i think america and and, and canada uh, is where the folklore i think really really started um so again bigfoot is he's, he's, he's believed to be an ape-like creature um that it will inhabit th- sort of forests of you know overgrown sort of marshlands um heavily dense woodland um and probably as far away from kind of civilization as you can as you can really uh, imagine um evidence is i mean it's all out there really i mean you've got stuff ranging from video recordings you know audio f- photographs visual sightings which obviously you can only take on you know face value uh, and of course you know large casts of believed footprints which i believe is where it all kind of really started uh, in in the states um you know again there were a lot of tales coming from from asia uh, you know specifically the himalayas you know up from from canada and the obviously the famed sasquatch um but it was really like i say that article written uh, in 1958 um which involved it was bluff creek in california which from what i can tell is pretty much the i mean it is the birth child really of of the american bigfoot certainly from what i've uh, kind of looked into and and this article um was about a construction worker uh whose name was jerry crew um and he i think he was part of a logging contractor so he was going to, to and from kind of the woodland um carrying you know, see trees and and you know, cut down logs and whatever. Some um, cases more like Northern California Territory yes. rather than near Mexico sort of. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. People, when they think of California, they think of LA, which is we all... We just think of LA, South. Hollywood and, and that yeah. kind of thing. And yeah, this was, yeah, this is more, yeah, if you, I mean, the, the, the kind of the region in the States, which kind of goes up to Canada is the Pacific Northwest. Hmm. So it's the, yeah, it's the, you know, the Northwestern part of, of California, which is where the valleys and, hills and, and woodland and, and whatnot are um and yeah he was yeah was essentially just driving his construction vehicle sort of down a road and something in the mud caught his eye he, he jumped out had a look um couldn't really believe what what he'd seen I believe he, he actually drives back to tell his boss what it was that he'd seen um and then they both return later that day um with the the, the sort of the casting um ingredients and the uh you know, and a camera, and that's where the that sort of famed um, photograph uh, came from. Okay. Um, so did, he, did he just see? Did he see a big foot, or did he just see the footprint? Or so literally, just f- f- so from the from what I can tell from, from the, the article, article, it was just the print. So it was just the big. 
I mean, everyone's seen, I mean, we, we can share a picture sort of somewhere yeah. on the socials for anyone who hasn't seen it, but it's basically the first photograph of a believed Bigfoot. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, he, he didn't see the creature, didn't hear any, you know, of the stereotypical kind of noises or wood knocking, it was literally just driving down an unmade road, you know, through some sort of woodland and the, the print amongst the mud sort of caught his eye. Um enough so that it, it kind of spooked him enough to sort of rush back to the site, you know, grab his boss to tell him what he'd seen. And then they all returned, you know, sort of later that day with the equipment to sort of make the cast, um, which is still on show even today, you know, in the, uh, you know, in a Bigfoot museum you know, around that region. Um, so, yeah, so there was no sighting of the actual animal. Um, yeah, it was actually just the, actually just the, the, the print. Um and it was the article, and it was following the photograph and the cast that Jerry Crew took, that led to the article that was written, um, like I say, in 1958, and that's where the term Bigfoot um, was was first coined. Um, I mean, prior to that, I think, like I said earlier, Canada had Sasquatch, and um, Asia, amongst others, had the Yeti, which mm. is basically just their version of of Bigfoot. So there, there were earlier accounts, as I say, but yeah. I think it didn't really grip the world. Until I don't think Bigfoot. until that gotcha. point. Gotcha. Cause they, you know, came from, cause there was Eric Shipton. He was up. Um, Shipton, Everest, yeah. wasn't he? Yeah, he was, he, he was up in the, Everest. It was 51, 1951. And he, yeah. um, he had the, the sound of mind to, put his, his climbing axe next to the print. And yeah, take as, a, as a kind of reference. Yeah. Yeah, um, um, yeah no, that was, you're right. Um, and did you, because I looked into that as well, because that, as you're right, as you say, that did come just before. Um, but there was a famed, because uh, I don't think they ever reached um, the summit. I don't think they ever got to the, the top of Everest in that expedition. Um, That's right, yeah. But what I did um, find out is the famed uh, explorer, climber, um, who did make the uh, the summit, Sir Edmund Hillary, was mm. actually with Shipton um, during that e expedition. So ah. it, to me, that kind of adds a certain certain level of credibility. Um, I mean, he was young. It was it was back when he was first starting the whole sort of climbing gig. <laughs> um, yeah. That he, you know that he was with uh, that he was with um, Shipton. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but again, that's an infamous photo that that was taken. And yeah, I think he put his. Mm. I think it was either his, his snow boots or a climbing axe or something alongside it to kind of as a as a scale to show how big this you know this 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 thing was. Um, there have been lots of people that have tried to um, debunk that photo, in particular with the, the bear double step and stuff like yes, this. Because so, there are bears in the Himalayas, and yes. they've tried to debunk it by using that, like um, they're using that as the... the yeah, it's basically... Um, yeah, for those who may not know, the, dub, the, the, the way that a bear walks is it does what they call a double step, where basically it leads with its front paw, and then it obviously follows up with its rear paw, but it the, the two paws essentially land in the same place. Obviously yeah. not, not at the same time, but sort of simultaneously. And so that can sometimes create a bigger impression, which would look like one giant footprint, whereas in actual fact, it's a, yeah, it's a, a mix of two together. Um, but yeah, they've, they've tried to debunk it. Um, and uh, I think... To the point where they, this is where they tracked... The movements of the brown bear which is which is kind of found in in that region and they did find that the himalayan brown bear can actually live at eighteen thousand feet which is where the shipton print was found um up um the himalayas um i've never thought that there was a case of them lying about it or trying to create a hoax because of the sort of men that they were um because of who they were and, and the time as well. I mean, it wasn't much long before um, the Jerry Crew photo, but 
you know, in the, the sort of the forties and the fifties, you know, men were gentlemen. They were, you know, held to a high esteem. You know, their their name was everything. It wasn't just what it they was. did or how they did it. You know, it was their name. And so, if they tried to lend their name to anything that was rubbish or you know a lie, you know, their community or the world would come down on them, and it would it would ruin anything that they ever did. You know, sort of going you know going forward. So for you know a famed explorer like Eric Shipton to put his name to it. Um, and not only that, but Sir Edmund Hillary as well, who was part of that expedition. Um, you know, I, th- I think that kind of does add a certain certain level of credibility to it. Like I said, like I said, I mean, they've yeah. never been able to disprove it. They've, exactly. they've never been able to actually say it is a hoax or it is a um, a double step or it was just a snow boot or, you know, whatever. I, I think based on the sort of people that they are, they're, they're, yeah. they're an out. You, we can rule out a hoax. As a I, I would, I, I would, I would 100%. say it's definitely not a hoax. There could be another explanation, so it's not necessarily saying yet. It's definitely a yeti or definitely a bigfoot. It could quite easily be a double step of a Himalayan brown bear, but Possibly. they've not been able to prove that as well. I mean, I, I did watch another documentary, um, interestingly enough, um, which did look into that, and they actually got it was a circus trained brown bear mm. absolute monster this thing and so they were able to get it to do a um double step yeah so they, I mean, it took them ages because the, the bear just didn't want to do it but they got it to walk through um like uh, clay yeah. so they could so they could obviously record the impression it took them a while to get um a decent one and even and they did achieve it in the end and even looking at it I mean, it was either a, a bigger bear in 1951 or it was a bigger creature. And although they managed to do it, mm. they then lined the two up to kind of show whether there was yeah. any, you know, kind of similarities. And and you could see to an extent that, yes, there was a sort of a similarity, but it wasn't it wasn't bang on. You know, it wasn't, you know, specific enough to kind of say, yeah, it was definitely a brown bear. It was just a double step. Like, let's move on. It's, it's definitely there is a possibility, but I don't think it's kind of nailed on, um, you know, by by any stretch. Yeah. Um, but no, it was, yeah, it was interesting you, you brought up actually, yeah, because uh, that was yeah that was just before. But I think because of where it, the, where the photo was taken, um, you know, and I think the people involved, I don't think it was really given much mind. No, you know, they kind of thought, oh well, okay, fine, well, you know, it was probably just a wind up, or you know, you're probably just. Um, I think actually the theory was, if I, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was that they were using things like altitude sickness and stuff as the as the the, the cause for them coming up with the photo and stuff. Like they they just went nuts, they hallucinated, or you know, they might even have created the print themselves because they knew it was going to be an unsuccessful climb. So they thought, well, we need to go back with something to add it, you know, to add some sort of purpose to the climb. So let's do this and take back this story that we found some, um, you know, some some creature. Um, and, I, and I think you asked whether or not that that's plausible as to the sort of people that they were. I mean, obviously, we didn't, we, we don't know no. them personally. We can't no. vouch for them or anything like that. But the stories of what we know of, of those two people, mm. at the very least. I suppose, yeah, to a certain degree, it's possible because we don't know them personally. Yeah, absolutely, or, yeah. We can't vouch for them. Mm. No, exactly. So it's a possibility, yeah, you're right. It's, um, yeah, it's, it, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a weird one when I saw that because I thought, right, well, they mentioned ships and I thought, well, Christ, I'd, I'd, I'd completely forgotten about this photo. And then it was only looking into the expedition and kind of who was with him and, and just to get a bit more info on it, it was only at that point that I realised that it was a very young Edmund Hillary, um, you know, that was kind of with him. Which was he, he went on to scale in Everest and, you know, obviously become Sir Edmund. So, you know, and I, I don't, I couldn't see any real accounts of him adding much sort of weight to it other than confirming that he was there and that he was with Shipton and that they all saw it sort of thing. But I think because of the time, like I say, they were heavily weighted down by the fact that it was probably altitude sickness you know they were probably losing their minds they were cold you know that the, the, the whole host of other ifs buts and maybes at that point it's only recently when people have tried to debunk it that they come up with the whole brown bear double step thing and you know and other sort of uh other theories but i think at the time it was just kind of 
brushed aside really um, and not really given much. Locally, they had all their own legends. Didn't they? The, t- the Tibetans yes. had their legends with regards to a creature that lived in the mountains. The Sherpas certainly had those. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, same legends as well. And but I think you're right in that um, the 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 photograph from 1958 was the first thing that really kind of blew it up to the masses. That oh my god, yeah. there was this huge footprint. Mm. What sort of, what does it belong to? And then all of a sudden, it's it's what that definitely be today. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that that def- as you said, that definitely spearheaded the whole legend, and I think that's where it kind of caught the imaginations um, of everyone. Um, because I, I can't remember the the exact stat, but I think it was something along the lines of that in in the ten years following the Jerry Crew photo in '58, there had been more reported sightings in america following that photo than what there had been in the previous 100 years so How many yeah years? Honestly, yeah so i think yeah i think it was 10 years following jerry cruz photo there were more bigfoot sightings across america than what there had been in the 100 years previous even to the point where there were certain states in america that had never had any rec- um sort of prior legend or myth or whatever mm. suddenly sprouted these sightings um, I think when you look at stats like that, you definitely then sort of think, all right, a lot of those were probably hoaxes, you know, the, the mind playing tricks on you, you know, you're out late at night or, you know, shape in the distance or paranoia, paranoia yeah, or, you know, if you believe paranoia, something. Paranoia, that's going to come up a lot, I think, paranoia. Yeah. Is, it certainly did when I was researching. Exactly, yeah, it especially when quite... from the hunter's recollections of, of stories or explorers deep in the woods, always on their own never told anyone where they were going so yeah i can definitely see you know that paranoia you know will sort of sort of come into it but um no i just thought it was very yeah very that stat was interesting i thought and i thought it was quite telling because th- since then obviously now every state slowly but surely has then had its own you know sort of versions of um you know of sightings and, and recordings um and i think that kind of that nicely kind of segues into nine years later Nine years later, yeah, Isn't absolutely. <laughs> um, which was possibly, or I think is possibly the hot, most hotly contested footage or supposed mm-hmm. footage of a Bigfoot. And that's the I past. think that I think there's ever, you know, I think there's ever been really. Um, well, the thing is, this it's one of those things again. Is everyone you think of Bigfoot and you see that still image. You see the still, oh, if you, even if you've never seen the footage. Looking at the camera. Yeah. That's, everyone knows that. It's synonymous with the word Bigfoot. It's, it's, I mean, it's got to be. I mean, yeah, arguably, you know, Jerry Crew's photo, you know, kind of really kicks it off. But I think in the hearts and minds of Bigfoot enthusiasts, mm. it was this next footage that I think really kind of holds. It's almost like the holy grail of, yeah. you know, well, of, it, of Bigfoot. It's, it even features in Batman Dark Knight. Does it? For Batman suspects. They have, it, they have it on the wall with a load of pictures of various Batman suspects and the still of the Patterson footage is on there. Right. right. I don't, I've yeah, never noticed that. Back, I'm going to have to go back and watch it now. Yes. When they, when they go, oh, you ca- captured the Batman yet? And he goes, oh, yeah, we're really close. Throws a bit of paper at it. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's still image of the Patterson footage. On there. No way. It's even it's now part of pop culture. Pop culture, yeah. Okay. Degree. I never knew that reference. That's cool, though, man. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go back and yeah, yeah you'll see go it back now and, and look for it. <laughs> and what, yeah, I'm gonna now. I'm actually, I'm definitely gonna. No, absolutely. But um, but yeah. But for those that think we're talking in code, um, what we are referring to is the infamous Patterson Gimlin footage, um, recorded in 1967. Um, again, much like the Jerry Crew photo was filmed in uh, Bluff Creek in California. So, you know, there's the the kind of the, the link there. Um, now, before kind of diving deep into this footage, I always, you know, ignorantly probably assumed that the footage was almost like a homage to the Jerry Crew photo, like mm-hmm. a kind of a sequel or a spin-off, if you like, to kind of think, right, well, he's now planted the seed right. and everyone's now going to think that there are Bigfoots. Well, let's go and, you know, let's go and film one or, you know, let's go and find one. Um, 
and like I say, it's been hotly contested between Bigfoot enthusiasts, you know, scientists, film producers, directors, like everyone who has who has seen it at some point has given their, you know, kind of two cents as to, um, you know, as, as to its authenticity. Um, I mean, and, and prior to, again, researching for this, I thought very much the same, that it was just, you know, a bit of fun. You know, someone who was wanting to break into film, you know, flexing their muscles and, and kind of showing what it was they could do um, and using that kind of legend, which was still relatively in its infancy, you know, only only being sort of really brought to the forefront eight or nine years prior. Um, but it's actually not the case. Um Okay. The the film, as say, is Patterson Gimlin. It's obviously fo- named after the two main guys, uh, the sort of director producer uh, that was involved, Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin. Um, as we mentioned again before the recording, um, there's never really been any kind of real is this fake or not? Because unfortunately, Patterson died of cancer um, within five years of the footage actually kind of releasing and and getting out amongst the world now whether it was was fake and behind the camera as well wasn't he yes and he was the yeah he was the guy behind the camera he was yeah sort of filming it all you know kind of at the time so whether it was fake i I don't know whether he ever would have actually you know kind of gone yeah okay fine it was it was a hoax or on his deathbed maybe that would could have been his you know sort of parting kind of thing but you know that's not the case. He, he certainly took it to his grave. If um, you know, if it, if it was a, a hoax, and, and again, as we mentioned, as far as I'm aware, Robert Gimlin is actually still alive, but he won't participate anymore in any kind of Bigfoot documentaries or any uh, sort of news articles. He's kind of he's kind of said all he has to say on it, um, yeah. and that's kind he's of gonna, that's kind of it. You. Yeah. He's, he's like, I'm not going over all that again. Yeah, he's he's kind of made his piece. He said his bit. You know, in fairness to him, it was quite some time ago, so he's probably he probably is sick to the back teeth of it. Um, but it, like we said, it's probably got to be the most famous footage um, of a Bigfoot that has mm. ever been recorded, provided, and you know, and, and sort of shared with the world. But the the interesting thing was they weren't actually there you know, as explorers or, you know, they're filming in the hope of filming a Bigfoot. And then they just so happened to catch one. They they actually had a specific uh, reason to be there in uh, in Bluff Creek. I can understand why people would think that because of Jerry Cruz's photo being taken in the same region. Exactly, yeah. Making people flock there to go and try and find more footprints or to try and find something else. And I can understand why anyone that hasn't looked into it any deeper might go, hmm. hang on a second, so sit in this yeah. one, and they happen to come across a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch, whatever it is you want to call it, and it just ha- just so happens to be there with their camera. You know, yes. and yeah. it, it, it's the sort of thing that I know that a lot of people like us would do. They'd go, right, there's something fairly local to me. I'm going to go off and see if I can find it. Like going on a ghost hunt or something like that. You know, exactly, it's, yeah. it's that sort of adventure. I think that's... Yeah, that's certainly what my feeling was on it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely, that was certainly my thought on it, and I'm sure that's probably what a lot of people think if they just kind of make the two connections and think, oh, well, that's probably just all it is. You know, he's just kind of trying to ride the the train of, you know, of Jerry Crew and, you know, kind of seeing where it can take him. But um, And there is some correlation to an extent, but not directly to um, to Jerry Crew, but they... So Patterson was actually there to film a documentary um, and it's based on a true story about a, an old miner, um, a, a, a sort of a, yeah, an, an old miner and, uh, you know, one of these, you know, wise Indian chief um, uh, sort of trackers oh, okay. who were on the hunt for a Bigfoot. So they were there actually feel it was going to be part documentary, oh, wow. part reenactment. So, right. so yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's oh, where you okay. think, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm done. It's, it's bollocks. Yeah. It's, <laughs> down, yeah. Yeah, and that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's probably not, probably wasn't the strongest start for that, but no, it's, um, it's, it's yeah, he was there to film the documentary. It was, it was a group of cowboys 
back in 1924 were being led by yeah an old mining sort of prospector and uh, uh, an Indian chief, a sort of wires mm. Indian chief uh, sort of tracker. Uh, like I say, they're on the, the hunt for a um, for a Bigfoot, and the story was basically recalling the account by one of the um, I think it was one of the cowboys. Uh, his name was Fred Beck. And it was going to be, so it was going to be using flashbacks, obviously by way of reenactment. And then the rest of it was going to be sort of documentary um, interviewing. I think you might, might have been interviewing Fred Beck uh, or certainly people that, that kind of knew him and knew the story because it's quite a, a famous um, account of an actual encounter with a Bigfoot. So not just a sighting, or kind of hearing noises and, you know, the stereotypical kind of, you know, wood knocking. Um, mm. And this one, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it was the Ape Canyon incident. Um, yes. Yeah. Which is what inspired the Patterson Gimlin footage, as I say. Um, and this basically just recalls the the encounter where the, 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 the cowboys were, um, they're actually attacked by what they believed at the time was a group of ape men. Um, they were, I think they were, they were basically down the bottom of a, a canyon in, in mm. you're sort of walking through the Creek, obviously either side of them is, you know, sort of a Valley type, um, set up with the, the rolling Hills come mm. leading down into the Creek. And one of, um, one of the group who I believe was, uh, Fred Beck kind of saw shadows, uh, and, and sort of noises kind of moving, uh, in the top of the. The, the sort of the creek I guess above them several feet above them and um they were the, the the you know the ape men as they were described were basically launching um rocks down into the creek oh, onto definitely. onto the group and to like their their camp um and they you know obviously were beside themselves they were trying to you know look into the into the the woodland above and to see kind of where it was coming from you know there was the you know the typical kind of chatter and the wood knocking and and sort of stuff between them all um and yeah they they waited it out they did they were so scared they couldn't leave their camp or like the, you know their encampment within the creek so they just waited it out you know the cries and the calling supposedly got closer you know, the rocks got bigger, you know, they were landing on, on top of a cabin. I think they had, um, and in and around, you know, sort of tents and stuff. Um, and so, yeah. And so that's, that was kind of the story that they were retelling. Um, I just, um, just to intersect there, what yeah. made them think that it was ape men? Did they, catch, did they actually catch a view of it? Were there any, Noises yeah. like whooping or anything, because like, obviously, uh, if you think of apes, you think about like chimpanzees and, and things like that, and um, yeah. even gorillas. I mean, gorillas they weren't they weren't really discovered by Western scientists until quite late, I believe. Quite late. I think it might even have been after the fifties. I think it might have been after, yeah, not until the the sort of the fifties, maybe even into the sixties, when they were first kind of, yeah, discovered and identified as a species. So yeah, at this point, they probably wouldn't have known what a gorilla was, um, yeah. I guess. So, yeah, so the account, so the, the, the whole ape men thing comes from obviously what they saw, which is the stereotypical kind of shadow, you know, amongst the trees of the elongated arms, you know, the, the big sort of head with humanoid features, you know, the yeah. broad shoulders. Um, and at first they thought it was only one, but then they heard it talking and then they, heard, you know, would sort of hear responses. And it was that kind of, it was that typical kind of I mean if anyone's watched any Bigfoot documentaries it was that stereotypical kind of cry high-pitched kind of yelling it doesn't sound anything like a gorilla really which is why I think you're able to differentiate whether someone's actually heard you know an ape or whether yeah. it is actually what people believe is to be a Bigfoot um 1852 gorillas the sub in central sub-saharan Africa that's 1852 right, okay so that wasn't that wasn't that long before and the sort of would word have carried from there you know, to Absolutely. the States, that's, yeah, so yeah, I mean, you don't know, I mean, it was interesting that Patterson was making a documentary on, on that story, because it's quite, um, it's quite a specific 
story kind of to that region. So it wouldn't have really had any global outreach. Whether he was influenced to do it because he'd seen the, um, you know, because he'd seen the Jerry Crew photo, and then there was obviously this story from the the twenties. But again, they used the term ape men. There was no mention of Bigfoot or Sasquatch or whatever. Yeah. So was that story localized? You know, because if it had got if it had reached Canada, for example, they would have said, "Oh no, that sounds like a Sasquatch." Which mm. then would have influenced this story, you would imagine. So, and that it's was interesting. Uh, first Na- well, what they call First Nations up in Canada, they're, they're yeah. the native, and that's what their name for it was. It yeah, was exactly. So, you would have thought if it had travelled up that quick, then a recount of the story would have travelled back to kind of say, "Oh, yeah, that sounds like what we have up here, which is a, a Sasquatch." But that yeah. doesn't seem to have happened. And like I say, it's interesting that that Patterson decided to film a documentary on that. Um, whether the the crew photo had, had gathered a bit of speed and a bit of popularity, and he thought, oh, here's a here's a way to create a quick buck, you know, is to make this um, you know documentary and you know kind of put it out there. And because everyone's invested in the Jerry Crew photo, I might instantly get some fans to my documentary. Um, I, I haven't seen any account of why he chose to to kind of do it, but that's what I would surmise if I was to have a guess. Um, and again, as we was talking earlier. Um, there was a guy who um, claims to have been part of Patterson's crew who was hired to wear an ape suit to, to be the, you know, to be the Bigfoot in the documentary for the, the reenactments and stuff, which has led some people to believe that this is the hoax and this is why it's not real and, and such, but um, he wasn't able to actually offer up any footage or even or, the suit. Or the suit, yeah. He wasn't able to offer up the suit. He wasn't able to offer up any footage of him in it or a photograph or or kind of anything. It was just his word against Patterson's, I guess. Um, and with there being so many diehard believers in the footage, I think no one ever really believed him. Um, I well, think it, somewhere it does note what his name was, but I didn't, because you know, it wasn't really credible, so I didn't really think to write his name down. But it, it, it does actually name the crew member that, that believed that he was um a part of the crew well it's, it's one of those things that, that because everyone knows that footage and everyone's seen various documentaries about that footage yeah the one thing that does come up is things like the muscle definition and the yes. way that the muscles twist as well yeah when they have especially with today's technology as well with, with mm. our video editing and everything else and I yeah mean, I've seen some even then yeah the dawn of 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 video recording where they've like from 1901 in Times Square yeah. and they've remastered the footage and it's phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and what they're able to do now with footage from like 197 yeah. and they've been able to remaster it and they've been able to see things like the muscles twisting. You can't, we can't, we, we can't build suits like that today that we can no. only do that with DGI really. Well, it, yeah. I mean, interestingly, th- there was a, a documentary that I, I did watch where they were kind of tearing apart the footage to try and see whether they could debunk it. And mm. there, there was five scientists. Two of them felt, thought it was nonsense and wanted to debunk it. Two of them were open-minded to believe that it could have been something. And then there was one scientist who she was kind of sat on the fence, wasn't really swaying, you know, kind of one way or, or another. Um but they, but one of the scientists actually tried to add some sort of credibility to it or some authenticity to the footage. But you know, as you rightly say, the the muscle definition in the legs as it's walking, the way that the muscles contort on its back when it turns to look at the camera, um, you know, that stuff that can only really be achieved now with the the type of suits and CGI and stuff that would be available back in the you know in fifty eight that wasn't really readily available and certainly not to Patterson, who I think at this point was broke. So this was his kind of the, um, one last flurry. Era as well. And yeah, they, you, I mean, all you've got to do is look at some of the Godzilla stuff. You know? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that shows yeah. you the, the caliber of what they were working with. Well, even if you look at the first sort of Planet of the Apes films, which was were, were probably in the seventies or something. Yeah. Which again, weren't, weren't that much after the Patterson film, and you can tell that they're they're suits. They're very generic. They're not figure 
fit in you know there's no sort of real real definition other than you know the, the sort of the well, it's plastic all about the, it's all chest and stuff, wasn't it? Really? yeah yeah um and, I, and the other thing that struck me as quite interesting was that one of the scientists did comment on the actual sex of the Bigfoot in the footage, and they compared a lot of the anatomy to a female ape. And really? yeah, and, and they, and what they said was that knowing that Patterson was broke, if he wanted to just make a quick buck make a cheap film and kind of get it out there, then you would just go to any Hollywood or any, you know, um, <laughs> fancy dress right. shop. Let us borrow your suit. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll have that one. I'll and just put you on, back later, don't you worry. Yeah, <laughs> and put on any, you know, sort of generic monkey suit and have someone, you know, sort of walking around the, you know, the woodland of the yeah. of the creek. But the fact that, you know, as you mentioned earlier, the, the muscle definition in the back of the leg, the way the muscles sort of contort and twist on its back. And the fact that actually one of the scientists, and this is where the, the kind of female of the species comes from, is actually commented on the fact that it looks like it had breasts. Right. That, that is the first I've heard of that. Yeah. When you when you look at the, and it's, it's obvious now he's said it, but I, I, I must admit I wouldn't have instantly thought, oh, look, <laughs> there's a pair of knockers on that. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the hair on her, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but she was popular. <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, yeah, that's where the cut of the credibility comes in. He said it would have been far easier to just pick up any generic, you know, monkey costume from any generic Halloween shop in in America, but the yeah. detail that this one had leads him to believe that there's more to it than just a guy in a suit. He firmly believes there isn't someone in a suit. Because, like I say, it looks like it comes down to the the gate as well, the steps that are being taken. The sh- that. Yeah, the, the stride, the height, the place and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. You, it's it's a it's not. If it's a man, I mean, we've all seen the monster movies, even today. When you yeah. look at some of the stuff that's that's out there, and it's a, of a monster yeah. that's like nine or ten feet tall. Yeah, you can tell it's a guy on stilts. Yeah, because it just doesn't doesn't marry up. There's the rigidity in the in the legs, like when when it walks, or if it's CGI, you just know it's poor CGI. But even with I mean, this, and you haven't got to be a diehard believer. Actors out there, there are some yeah. brilliant ones out there, but they're still as believable as a man yeah. in a suit. Yeah, and it can only get you where, so far. Yeah, yeah, that's where I think this Patterson footage, where so many people have analysed it and gone over it with a fine tooth comb, so much that they've been able to. Yes. Get, I believe, in my opinion, does discount that it's a man in a suit. There's something mm. else to it. Yeah. There's, there's, and if it is a man in a suit, it far surpasses any like technology that we've got today. Let alone, that, that, yeah, especially at, at that time. Yeah, definitely. But I think, I think for me, what done it was the, the anatomy, side of things. You know, they, they, weren't, they weren't really talking about how pixelated it looked or how the camera was, you know, moving up and down or, or you know, or anything like that. Um, but an interesting point about the movement of the camera, because like, like I said before we recorded, you know, you always can tell when it's a, a dodgy video because the camera is all over the shop and you can't really fixate on what it is you're supposed to be looking at. But in the the, the Patterson footage, the, the first um, capturing of the creature was actually done by horseback because they were traveling down to the creek. And so Patterson, Gimlin, and one other crew member were actually on horseback riding down to the creek, which is why, you know, you see the camera sort of shaking and and a bit sort of up and down. It's not until Patterson jumped off the horse and made his way across the creek to try and catch up with the creature that it's a little bit more um, steady, which is where I think the famous still comes from. At at this point, Patterson's actually started to run after it. so yeah, that was that kind of helps debunk that theory, I guess, of it being no, yeah. fake for that reason, possible. possibly. But um, but no, it's just, it's just the anatomy, like you said, the, the muscle definition when it was walking, you could see the muscle contract and move. You wouldn't get that in a 1950s monkey costume. You know, you've got the no. muscle definition, just to how stocky and, and big it looks. Now you'd have to find a big enough actor. Mm. to wear that suit to the point where it looks figure hugging or it'd have to be a bloody good costume 
which again, a lot of people have sort of debunked just for the time, you know, props and prosthetics and, and that kind of thing wasn't anywhere close to where it is now. And again, for someone on a shoestring budget like Patterson, it would have been non impossible for him to recreate it to such a quality. Hmm. Um, and yeah, and just like the height. The, the, the scientist said that it could possibly have been female. In yeah, that, I'd say he said that, that it looks really like, part of it. although it's got the stereotypical, you know, like long, shaggy sort of chest hair, he said that they looked like there was some sort of pectoral definition to the point where he thought that they were breasts, therefore mm. being a female species or version of, the, you know, the Bigfoot. Mm. And so, and that was where, where kind of he landed on the fact that he felt that this was pretty bang on believable or, or authentic because it would be even more difficult for anyone at that time to recreate or to even know what a female of that species would look like and, and to have the, the the sort of the materials and stuff available to, to recreate it. I guess we can just sort of wrap up really the, the Patterson footage really. Yeah. And uh, just, just going back quickly, you know, the, it had the stereotypical kind of short, dark kind of you know shaggy hair covering almost 80 to 90 percent of its of its body it had the elongated arms um but the the real intriguing thing for me which is what the scientist pointed out in the i think it was called the Defin uh, bigfoot the definitive guide uh, yeah. is it was a three-parter and it was in one of the it was in one of the episodes where they, they basically said that the creature looked like it had had boobs and he said the the telling thing for him was that every other account, either before or since, has mostly been describing a male of the species. So yeah. it would have been very yeah. easy for Patterson to just recreate one of those if it was a hoax. Why would he go to the lengths of showing a female version of, of the species to try and add some sort of credibility? Because like, like, like we went over, it would have just been, it would have been a lot harder for him Um you know, to, to do it. And he could have picked a far easier costume as we've already kind of, um, you know, spoke about. Uh, there, there's obviously the height of the creature, you know, far higher than any sort of recorded human, you know, at that time. So again, it would have taken some sort of internal structure to the costume, mm. you know, to kind of, to, you know, create the height and the, the stature that it, you know, that it had. Um, the, the only thing that kind of goes against it is that the, the accounts from I think Giblin himself and members of the supposed crew have each kind of given their own account as to how long the footage was um, and also how tall the creature was. I mean, it kind of ranges from six to nine feet in height, depending mm -hmm. on whose account you listen to. Um, the footage, I think the genuine footage, I think was only taken about 30 seconds after they first spotted the animal down by the creek. Because when they first spotted it, like I said, they're coming down to the creek on horseback. Mm. They see it on the other side of the creek from them, sort of kneeling down, looking at the floor behind a uprooted tree. So it's foraging or burying something. That's when they first see it. It's when they get towards the bottom of the creek. That's when the footage starts. So that's roughly about 30 seconds. According to Patterson, it was about 30 seconds after he first saw it. Um, but that, but even that varies. I think Gimlin said it was a couple of minutes after, like they'd already been there setting up their shot and deciding what they were going to film, and then yeah. they spotted it, you know. And that's Gimlin. Oh. Patterson thought, you know, has said that it was 30 seconds after, um, after first spotting it that they started filming it. So the two main guys have, have both got a different story. Other members of the crew have got differing stories with regards to how tall it was, how fast it moved, how long they saw it for. I think one guy actually, one member of the crew actually bolted. When he he saw it, he, he supposedly ran back to the start of the trail where their equipment and camp and whatever was. Like, fuck <laughs> this. Fuck just, this shit. I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> A bye bye, <laughs> and just a bye bye, yeah. and just bye -bye. uprooted bye -bye. it and 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 legged it. Um, so yeah, so there's that that kind of goes against it. When you look at the footage itself, that's for me enough of the evidence really that you that you need, which is further backed up, I think, with the the scientist that yes. dived into the anatomy of the actual creature that was filmed, not just the quality of the footage or anything. He was more about 
actually look at the animal, look at the anatomy, look at its muscle, look at how tall it is, how it contorts, how, you know, the stride that you can visibly see. And it looks like it's a comfortable stride. It doesn't look like a human, you know, like over, over stretching to make that step. It looks comfortable. There were two things that, that put me more on the path of being a believer of the footage than not. And that was, the first one was, um, knowing the backstory as to why Patterson and Gimlin were there in the first place. Hmm. The fact that they were filming a documentary, but it was more so, but it was more so following a group that, that a group that had had the experience. It wasn't him trying to have his own experience or record his own visual of the creature. He was retelling the story of someone else that had in and around that area. And so I kind of thought if it was just off the back of the Jerry crew photo and you thought, you know what? I want to make a film. This is my million dollar moment. And that he grabbed his camera and Gimlin and a couple of crewmates and went down to the Creek and then just so happened to film one in broad daylight. Then I'll be like, oh, come on, man, like get out of it. That's just, that's, I, I can't even believe that. <laughs> and I really want to. <laughs> it is a dastardly plan. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> um, but the fact that he was there, I mean, yes, he's still filming something Bigfoot related, but he's he's filming something that's a retelling of someone else's story that happened he, thirty or forty years prior. Yes, he he was he was out there filming something that he didn't know was connected to a Bigfoot. Mm. That's what it is. He was out there filming an ape man interact yeah. encounter, and yeah, I, would at that time would they have put the two and two together? I mean, the only reason we, we would put two and two together now is because of all the stories that have happened. Hindsight since. and everything else. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, he wasn't daft, Patterson. He was, yeah. you know, a sort of an inventor of sorts. You know, he was a creative, you know, so, you know, obviously he was a filmmaker. He was a filmmaker and yeah. whatever else. So it's it's not outside of his mental capacity to have put two and two together and gone down there but to specifically try and film something and and that's but that's where i'm kind of if he went down there to make his own documentary about tracking a bigfoot and yeah. going in that looking in that area to see if he could find the same group of ape men or bigfoot whatever that attacked um fred beck mm. for you know from back yeah, in the, the 1920s or whatever then i'd be a little less inclined to believe it because i thought well you've gone there with the hope of finding something oh and look you found it the intention that's, behind it. Yeah, yeah, that's where it would kind of be like, mm, you know, I'm not so sure. But the fact that it was Bigfoot related, but it was just retelling someone's account of an experience that they had had. That was the first thing I thought, okay, well, he wasn't going there with the intention of trying to spot it. The second thing is obviously this scientist from the, um, like I said, I think it was called the Definitive Guide to Bigfoot that mm. on uh, on Amazon. Which is why I saw it. And... Uh, and yeah, and, and and he was the one. He was one of the two scientists that were kind of more in its favour. Um, and but but he wasn't like a diehard. Yep, this is definitely real, and this is why. He would. They would all kind of sit, uh, stand, and listen to each other's kind of reasons as to why. And he was like, okay, well, let's let's freeze the footage and let's look at the actual creature. Let's look at the the big foot, and that's where he came out with all the stuff that we've that we've kind of spoken about. And that for me was like, okay, I mean, he's a scientist. He's supposedly a credible scientist. You know, he's put his name to something like this, which no one in their right mind can genuinely prove, but he's put a thesis to it, which I think lends it credibility and almost an authenticity. I mean, believe what you want of Patterson. Um, you know, was it, you know, was he an opportunist, you know, a con man of sorts? Was he just trying to make a quick buck? Yeah, quite possibly. Possibility. But, I mean, I don't know whether I don't know whether he knew he had cancer at the time, but he died less than five years later, mm. so he wasn't really able to benefit from any kind of royalties or any sort of money that it would have made. I mean, the well, I mean, documentary is actually yeah. out there to watch. You can actually watch because all we've seen is that footage of what they saw whilst making the documentary. But just to close off on the um, the Patterson yeah. stuff, interestingly. Yeah. The story of Fred Beck um, and the uh, the other uh, sort of miners or, or, or cowboys, whatever, who are who are being led, um, you know, by this Indian chief, 
um, th their story or their recount was actually debunked. Right. But they weren't in it to cause a hoax. They genuinely thought they were being attacked by a group of ape men or who would later be referred to as Bigfoot. They knew none the wiser. They were just, you know, I guess, you'd, you know, sort of simple townsfolk who were, you know, out doing their prospecting job or whatever it was. They came under attack. They described it exactly how it happened. However, <laughs> it was later confirmed, and th this made me laugh, it, it was later confirmed by a local YMCA camp that it was a tradition of um, young campers to basically throw stones down into the canyon. Now, obviously, on this same night, this group of campers supposedly were doing it, shouting and hollering and doing whatever is part of their tradition, not knowing that Fred Beck and the other miners were camping down in the canyon. Right. Or, or like amongst the amongst the creek. Gotcha. So like a bit of tree cover and, and stuff like this, because wouldn't they yeah, have so Fred, a... Fred Beck and oh, were at the yeah, so they were at the bottom of the canyon. Yeah. So almost amongst the creek, which is where Patterson and Gimlin were aiming for. Gotcha. The the camp was up the up at the, the higher end of the ravine or the, the canyon. So they yeah they were protected by the night for one, but they were also protected by yeah trees tree lions you know bushes you know undergrowth you know whatever. You're not hearing so, these words and whatnot, and in all the confusion and everything else like that, the chatter that these boys these kids might yeah. have could have sounded like animals. something that they hadn't heard before. Yeah. We hear that urban foxes around our way all the time. It always sounds like a woman screaming, you know. So yeah. So if you just flip that around and yeah, yeah, it's possible. So it's yeah, possible. So, I mean that's There's not. No I mean, involved at all. It just I don't know whether just... it was actually ever confirmed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the local uh, scrotes. <laughs> the local scrotes. Yeah, I mean that's basically what it was. It was just a group of. We've got a few around our ways, haven't we? So yeah, haven't we? Just yeah. <laughs> so it it just it looks like the whole Patterson footage was based on a story that was genuine to these miners that kind of wraps up the Patterson footage yeah. specifically and, and, and that kind of part of the world. But I think it's also worth noting that 70% of the world's sightings take place in the Pacific Northwest. Mm. Bring in mind, you've got Canada, you know, Russia, which I think is still the biggest country in the world. You know, you've got Asia, very, you know, in various parts of that continent. They've all got their own legends, myths and stories that the Pacific Northwest in the United States still holds the monopoly on, you know, Bigfoot sightings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that wraps up the kind of the, the Patterson thing. What I've been looking at is I've been uh, looking at the, the British side of things and right. uh, the whole old flesh and blood theory um, with regards to... Um, it being an actual physical creature. So yeah. on the over here in Europe, we have various different names for it. It's never just the one thing. Um, we've got names from the wild man, the green man, woodwose, or the wood yeah. moose, uh, however it is you pronounce it. Which um, I believe is more of a British one. Woodwose. Yeah, yeah from what, more like Bristol, sort of Somerset, that kind of uh, region. That's where that one comes from, if I remember rightly. Well, we, there's even um, stories of like the Scandinavian trolls as well, right? And yeah. Slavic leshies. So, yeah, it seems like um, if it is an actual physical flesh and blood creature, then it has some sort of basis in nature. Um, yeah. What some people seem to think that happened is the reason why we might have sightings over here as well as Europe, and by over here I mean the British Isles is that around about 12,000 years ago, the ice age came to an end um, and it ushered in a time period known as the Younger Dryas. And in the Younger Dryas time period, there was huge geological changes right, right away across the world. I mean, ice caps were melting almost yeah. instantly. Um, oh, so you mean global warming has, has happened already? Who would have Shock thought? horror. Who would have I thought know. that? <laughs> almost like it goes on a cycle. It's like it happens recurring. Yeah, I mean, I that's, know, right? well, that's amazing. There's various, theory, <laughs> various theories as to why Younger Dryas occurred. 
Yes. There are some people that believe it was uh, uh, several comet impacts on the Northern Hemisphere, which, um, which basically melted the Northern ice cap instantly. Okay. Two miles wow. thick of ice. Wow. And it, it just went... Um, which rose the sea levels three to 400 metres globally. Wow. Now, there's wow. a lot of evidence. I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. There's a lot of evidence for yeah. that having a huge impact on the megafauna in America. So North America. Mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of evidence, geological evidence for that. But Europe in itself looked very, very different to how it does today. I mean, for instance, there's um, a submerged area of, of land between... The British Isles and Denmark that is mm. known as the Dogger Bank. I don't know why they call it Dogger Bank. I don't. They could have come up with a better name than yeah. Dog. <laughs> oh, no, I'm pretty sure. Well. Dogger, I'm pretty sure Dogger Bank is at One Tree Hill in Leon City. <laughs> 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 Anyone that's local to that will get that. We'll know. Yeah. Maybe later on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the the actual land mass that is now submerged is was was known or is now known as Dogger Land. And that was, um, it would have been vast for forests, it would have been uh, swamp mm. land, it would have been a huge yeah. um, human presence there as well. Yeah. So where we've got the, the fishermen and everything at the moment in, in the North Sea and through the channel, they with their trawler nets, they are bringing up everything from mammoth bones to large extinct animals like the remains of them uh, we've got even human tools and, and such evidence oh, of okay. that being nice. dredged up and the worst bit about it is because there's so much fishing there there's no way of being able to research that area yeah being able to actually dive down and actually research that area to see what they can find makes sense yeah so the idea is that the british channel itself didn't exist it would have been a small river. Right. That's it. So that's how they believe that if this wild man, this big creature, this uh, creature that's a lot along the lines of, well, a lot of people believe Gigantopithecus. Yeah. Gigantopithecus, if anyone doesn't know, was a creature that did exist. Um, it happened to exist around about the same sort of time, about 10,000 years ago, in an area that is now southern China and Indonesia. Thailand, Vietnam, Thailand, Vietnam, Vietnam yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it was like a giant orangutan. I didn't, I didn't know prior to diving deep into the, the whole Bigfoot thing. I, I, and obviously, you mentioned it whilst we were researching, but I hadn't, hadn't heard of it. Um, and obviously, you know, it adds a, a lot of credibility to the the sort of the stories or the legends in and around in and around that area. Because um, didn't they for years actually believe that it was just a large humanoid? That and that's where a lot of the legend came from but it's only been in recent years that they've actually determined yeah, that it was uh, just a, a large a large orangutan basically yeah absolutely and they've, um, they've been able to recreate various um sculptures based yeah. on its the the bones that they've found um yeah. so it's a creature like that has existed in the world hmm. let's, let's put that out there so yeah. it is then also possible for a variant of that mm. creature to exist elsewhere in the world. Mm. So there could be a northern version of it or a European. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. If it, if it, and it is, yeah. it's a creature that existed, they've proved that it existed. There's actually a, a skull, I think, and other, other bones that they've found. Right. Um, so that obviously lends credibility to any stories of creatures from back in the, you know, sort of the early day. For that region of, as of well. that type that of region. thing, yeah. Because I think there were some, I think the earliest cave paintings, if I remember rightly, date back to about 500 AD. So again, if it's that far back and this creature actually existed, then it's it's highly possible that the stories have come from somewhere. They're not just, you know, science fiction writers having, you know, having a bit of fun. Absolutely. The thing is, we can only get so much information from fossils. Yeah. Um, or even, yeah, exactly. There's only because DNA it, it deteriorates over time, um, so they can only. Whenever they say something is so old, it's a guess. In yeah, a, in yeah. a lot of cases, yeah. oh no, I'm being a bit wishy washy with it, but that is what it tends to be. Mm. So it is plausible that a creature like that could actually be and existed in in Europe at the oh, time around about yeah. ten 
10 to 12,000 years ago before mm. the sea levels rose. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. this is where this is where it gets into the British stuff. Yeah. But just to cut in just before you dive into it, I think it's also worth noting that they believed from the size of the skull and the, the bones that they found is that the Gigantopithecus could have weighed anything from 400 to 600 pounds and could reach anything up to 12 feet in height, which lends a lot of support to a lot of the stories that you hear about the supposed Bigfoot, because mm. the weight and the height is very much around, around that, you know, those kind of uh, measurements. So the fact that something like that has actually existed at some point, again, yeah, just kind of adds some credibility. Add credibility to it because yeah. it's, if nothing like that had ever existed, then it would just be fairy tales. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which Could we'll come on to in other episodes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll that one. <laughs> obviously, a lot of my research has, has taken me for the British side of things down British Bigfoot Research Organization. Yes. Um, there's only about 30 to 40 researchers in the field, probably yeah. a lot more like us that are just sitting behind computers and clicking yeah. away yeah um, and not gonna lie i'm gonna have i had to sieve through a lot of various generic oh you have to yeah because so much of it is just such nonsense like something or i you know i heard something or you know nothing that was they didn't they, see they heard a, a wood knock on a tree they heard a, a crying out or you know, they, they heard a, a whooping or a, a, a sort of a yelling of, of, of some description. Yeah, there's the, there is the stereotypical kind of sightings or experiences, which I think people just believe they've heard. They, they go out there with a willingness to want to hear it. And so, you know, like what we were saying earlier, you could hear just a, a normal rural raccoon or fox or whatever's, you know, native mm -hmm. to your area making a crying or a howling sound. And if you want it to be something else, you're going to build it up in your mind to be that something, you know, it's going to. And the thing is, some of the tales as well, they're not, they're not all modern. As in like, they're not no. just like the 20th century or anything like that. No, no. There's one that does date back to 1879. Um, wow, right, so okay. 19th century we're looking at in, in that particular yeah. one. It's known as, uh, it's known as the Beast of Bridge 39. Nice, uh, I like that. Good name. I knew you'd like that. It sounds like a horror film, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Being, being a, a you know an aspiring author, that instantly uh, just yeah, I just feel a little light bulb just go ding. <laughs> Check out his word pad. Check it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> right. So the the first story that I'll go into, I won't really go into them in chronological order or anything like that, but just got them as as they are on here. Yeah, that's cool. So it follows. Um, again, this is out of the British Bigfoot Research. Um, organization and it's Adam oh. Paul Bird, father and son. Oh. Um, they were investigating in Yellow Ham Hill, in Puddleton, Puddleton Forest in Dor Dorset. Okay. Um, Dorset. Dorset. Oh, yeah, we're Lovely part of the world, Dorset. Dorset. <laughs> 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 um, Sorry to anyone who lives there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a scene of many historical wild man sightings so there have been lots of right. accounts of women being abducted by wow or <clears throat> attempted abductions by mm. wild men so okay. there's kind of like um may have been the inspiration for that film that came out years ago bigfoot's wife or something like that i think it was called oh jesus <laughs> terrible, okay. terrible b movie right kind of entertaining there's supposed to be like a blair witch found footage sort of thing it was I think I saw one like that, but I don't I didn't remember that that's what it was called. It was a I think I remember it was just a yeah, like you said, like a Blair Witch found footage type thing, but it was about a, a, a couple, young couple that went just for a, a camping trip in, in the woods. They were aware of local kind of tales and folklore, but just thought it was all nonsense. So he went on this like romantic kind of trek to you know to sort of camp in the woods. And basically the girl gets <laughs> girl gets snatched by a, a Bigfoot. The, the end of the footage is the guy trying to find her. Mm. Um, but then the rest of the film is about him trying to convince people that it happened and that he didn't kill her. Because yeah. that's what everyone sort that's of right. thinks. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. Is that the I same one? or Bigfoot's wife, I think. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> what it should be called. Up, to be if honest. Not, <laughs> if not, we're making one. <laughs> yes, that is it. We're making a film called Bigfoot's wife. It's not going to be X-rated. 
<laughs> but Mrs. Bigfoot, because she's pissed Mrs. off that he gets all the he, he gets all the all the fame and all the notoriety. It's about time she got some screen time. That's she's the, sure. she's at home thinking, "Right, I'm here watching the kids, and you're off getting all the fucking fame." <laughs> now it's my turn. <laughs> so, getting back. Sorry, to, gone. <laughs> getting back to the wild man abductions and whatnot. Well, they decided yeah, yeah. Um, this was in 2014, so they decided that they were going to go and investigate the area. This right. was in the, in the summer, middle of summer, not f- far from the summer solstice as well. Um, and they yep. entered the location, um, the woods, the Puddle Town, Puddle Town Forest. Um, and they entered it about 7 p.m. Um, they went right. to an isolated part of, of the forest because that's where they knew that not many people were going to be walking. And it turns out that a lot of these abductions or attempted abductions. Right were being um, were taking place on the the footpaths that you get through public yeah. forests and okay. such. All right. So they decided, right, we'll go off the trail as much as you can in Britain anyway. Mm. Go off the trail and uh, see what we can find. So the, what they did was they went around, and they did what most Bigfoot uh, researchers do. They went in and knocking trees and whooping right. um, yeah. and hoping for some sort of response, but they didn't get anything. Sure. So this is um, apparently something that a lot of Bigfoot researchers do. They try various different things where they just clap in a certain way. You know, right. you make different sounds with your hands. So they tried yeah. that. Okay. And right away, they started getting some knocking responses. So they started getting some knocking responses. I'll even I'll, I'll share you the link to their YouTube channel as well, to their to this particular video. Sure. Um, and it does add that it's, you can hear something. You can hear something in response. I don't know quite what it is because um, we're never in Britain. We're never too far away from someone else. You, you exactly, can't really yeah. get lost in the in the wilderness here, um, yeah. unless, of course, you're on something like Brecon Beacons. But even yeah. then, you're not too far away from the military, who often do their training out there. Yeah. Um, so basically, what happened was, as they started getting their their knocking and whooping started coming back to them with responses and everything um they also found possible prints and uh tree stick structures that, on that day as well so it then went silent and uh, they decided that they were going to leave but then they came back two days later and uh, they got more knocking responses um and more whooping responses um like i said we've got a video that well they've got a video of that um, which we can pop on the socials somewhere, and even for yourself, Cam, you can have a look at that and, and see. Yeah, good. Yeah, like I said, I didn't, um, I didn't look into a lot of the, well, any of the, uh, yeah, sort of the British stuff because I knew that was going to be very much kind of your thing. So I sort of left well alone. And to be honest, I'd been sort of outdone by all of the, uh, you know, sort of American accounts and and stuff. So yeah, mm. no, yeah, so it'd be good for. Yeah, me to look at um, some of it as well. Because I only I only saw one account, but it was very much like the the sort of the Jerry Crew of account of the fifties. So yeah, it wasn't... There's, there seems to be a fair lot of that, and I've kind of cherry picked some of it. Um, I mean, the the next one that I will go on about is um, about Deborah Hatswell. Um, right. Deborah Hatswell is she's quite a prominent figure um, in the UK Bigfoot community. Oh right. Um, she's been she's she had a very traumatic and i'm going to bring it down a little bit unfortunately sorry guys but she did have quite a, a traumatic experience that um with with a wild man which is what she used right. um this is where we need like a a trigger warning like a <laughs> oh i'm not gonna no there's no Just detail people I'm not, it's, we're not there's no torture porn guys there's no, no torture okay porn. well we don't we don't do we're going to some sort of bestiality i thought we, we don't do put that. a warning or something but bigfoot's wife Part two. Part two. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're not doing that. We're not no, doing that. No, no. We, we don't have one of those smutty channels. We don't no, do that. Not like that no. here. But basically, she's done lots of podcasts and uh, and interviews. Right. Um, and and what she does, she now works closely with. Um, I, I think she is actually a, a, a member of the BBR, the British Bigfoot Research. Right. Um, she helps other people that have had um, traumatic similar experiences. Now, mm. the one thing I will say is that she doesn't go into details about her own experience. Only I watched that um, that documentary, um, Elusive. Okay, yeah. And she features on that. Right. 
what I will say is when she's retelling her story as, as little as it is, her reaction is so visceral and so wow. harrowing, really, that mm. it can't be anything other than what she's experiencing right now is PTSD. Right. There is no doubt about that based on her her reaction to it all. And yeah, yeah. As, and I'll get into the elusive documentary mm. it, itself and yeah, what sure. I think of that. But, That'd be good, yeah. If I didn't get around to sort of watching it again because it was more on the, the sort of British side, I, I had to sort of leave it alone at some point. So, yeah, it'd be good to know what you found from it. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it, what I what I got from it with her was that yeah, her experience happened in uh, around Salford, which is near Manchester in England. Yeah, and she was fifteen years old, and she was walking through the woods, and she was stopped by a giant wild man in her bath um that's all that we really know that's all that she will really tell she won't tell uh, what she did after that or where what was what it i mean she gives an account as to what it looks like because someone's been able to recreate the sketch which you can find by searching up deborah hatswell straight away and you'll come across the 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 depiction of this wild man the sort of the police interpretation sort of thing yeah, like an e-fit sort of thing, yeah, but this, yeah. this being like the mid '80s at the time, right. early '80s possibly, um, it would have been it would have been a sketch. So it yep. would have been a sketch artist going at it. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, so that, that that really from what I can tell is that it's it's, it's her experience of just that caused such a, a a traumatic. It was such a traumatic event for her that she couldn't couldn't go anywhere else with it, and what. The one thing that she did say, well, even though she was always behind the laptop with regards to the, the BBR, mm. doing the interview for Elusive allowed her to deal with the trauma of that experience. And now she actually right. goes out into the field. She couldn't go into, she couldn't go, well, the woods, <laughs> really, not necessarily the field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to the wrong place if you go to the field. I see, yeah. But, it's, but so she's she's now been able to actually go out into the woods and actually go and research it herself right. um, like go back to where her account happened no just anywhere oh just anywhere right okay anywhere anywhere she couldn't she couldn't even right. walk past a wooded area without thinking the wild man was standing behind one of the trees coming to get her right that's so how did... much it had affected her for like 30 odd years so does she um, go into kind of what the the wild man did to her or what he said when he stopped her or nothing nothing at all i mean i've i've looked she's done loads of of podcasts she's got her own podcast but she's done lots of interviews and and things like this and she talks ever so briefly about what actually happened and i don't want to surmise anything that happened or or whatever to go on anyway yeah that she that she couldn't speak about it even now. It's right. seems like she's able to be over it to a certain degree to be able to go right. and investigate it herself by literally walking into the woods herself. But okay, it seems like she can't talk about it, which is um, which is not something you hear often. What you hear often with Bigfoot sightings and, and accounts and experiences mm. is the opposite. I did this, I did that. There's all this detail. Yeah. There's all that little, little detail. Yeah. She's just coming forward and saying, "Look, I had an experience." Don't want to talk That's about all it. the detail you're getting. Yeah, I, it's a tricky one. Like if, if I if we hadn't have done the research that we had, and you'd you'd told me about that, then I'd instantly I'd be sitting there thinking, "Well, it's just rubbish." Then she's making it up because of when you go through every other account from all the other documentaries and, and on, you know, YouTube, the internet and whatever else, everyone is so keen and quick to give you their story. But not only that, but they can tell you the day it happened, the time, what they were wearing, like what yeah. they could smell in the air, like, you know, that they could give you every minute detail. And sometimes I think the more detail you get, the more rubbish it is. Yeah. Because there's no way you would remember that, that Absolutely. much. And so that's why I think instantly it's got to be, you know, that's got to be rubbish. But then, you know, as you say, she she isn't quick to have her five minutes of fame, although subsequently she has had fame from it. So it's, so it's clever, you know, if, if that's how she wanted to work it. But yeah. she's not been out there and sold the story, given the details, told everyone exactly what woods it was or 
you know, the exact description of what it looked like and what happened, what it said to her, how it spoke. She hasn't really priced it, is what you mean. Yeah, exactly. She hasn't dragged the arse out of it and, yeah, and, and sort of given it her own, and given it her own autopsy because she doesn't want the, the fame because she was, you know, deeply traumatized by it. And so I think at the moment, until I hear more, I think at the moment I'm probably perched right on the fence between kind Absolutely. of believing her and thinking that it's, kind of just a, a you know sort of a have a go sort of story you know i mean to add a, maybe a little bit more credence to her experience there is um there comes another account uh, maybe about 10 years later um right. a young lad who's 12 or 13 his name was mark him and his friend who was also called mark maybe with a c or a k i don't know um had uh, they'd actually set up a little running course um in the woods um, right. like a little assault course sort of thing and it wasn't far off of the footpath and it turns out it was only about 20 miles away from Salford it doesn't say whereabouts exactly what was the nearest right. town um, but it turns out it would have been in the 20 mile radius of where Deborah had her experience right okay so, um, they decided to do one more run through before heading home um, on that particular day um, they started off down the track um, and they stopped um, as I saw someone up ahead. Now, as it is polite, you if you're running through the woods, you kind of stop and make yourself known yeah. and, you know, slow exactly. down, move uh, move around someone. But um, they thought it was odd because they were off the path. Right. And if dog walkers are usually about, because they initially said that I thought it was a dog walker, someone's coming. Usually they would be on the footpath, which is about 15, 20 feet away. Right. So it was odd that they were already off the off the track yeah. as it was. Um, but as he said, slow down, someone's coming. Um, the person stopped and turned and turned around, turned toward them. That's when he noticed the sheer width of that person um, and then quickly realised that it wasn't a person. So if you can imagine it, they're seeing this mass. Um, from what they say, it's a big, deep mass. And it, they saw muscle definition. He didn't say saw anything in the face, but what he did see, what he does notice, um, was the muscle definition of his torso. So as right. it turned around, you could see the muscle definition there. Right. It took a big, deep breath and made a screechy groan sound. Right. Uh, he said that uh, he said that he couldn't impersonate it. It was a sound that he's never heard heard before. Um, and obviously, they took back up off the path out of there. Now, it turns out that was only about 20 miles away from where Deborah had her experience. Um, but he, again, it was one of those things where it plagued him for okay. about 20 years of his life before he actually decided to, one, go back to that area. Mm. He went back to the area um, with his, uh, in his adult life um, with his wife or girlfriend. He doesn't say whether they're married or not. Um, just to kind of recant the experience and, and the whole time he was there, he had this unnerving feeling that he shouldn't be there, which is right, okay. like it was an uneasy feeling in the air, which, yeah. which ties into a lot of different things as to it has that spooky feel. It was kind of natural anyway, because he didn't necessarily want to actively go back there anyway, but maybe no. thought it was a part of him coping with it and getting over the experience. So he was probably already... He probably already had that unsettled feeling anyway as soon as he stepped foot in there. And that, that was probably only heightened once it all started coming, like flooding back. Absolutely. That gives you a good idea. That particular account there gives you a good idea as to the amount of them that I actually found that was so much like this. So I don't want to keep yeah. retelling the same stories over yeah, exactly, and over. Yeah. This one um, from Scotland, in fact, um, yeah. it comes from the Angus region. Is a little bit more interesting and I'd like to see what you think of how she describes it. Right, okay. So there's a young girl, um, her name's Charmaine, and she was around six or seven years old um, and she took the dog for a walk whilst collecting newspapers for her gran and her gran's neighbour, is, which is what she would do. She'd take the go down to the local shop, which was a bit of a walk down the way because it's up in Angus, Scotland, yeah. um, in the mid-80s, it's right. really been. Um, and as she's walking down the, the dirt track um, to the local shop, the dog, which was up ahead off a lead, stopped dead in its tracks and began whining and snarling and had its hackles all up. Um, 
and kids being kids, I don't really take any notice of that. They just she just wandered on right right past right past the dog that was stopped dead still. Yeah, and um, it wasn't liking whatever it was that was up ahead. So Charmaine just walked straight past the dog, and as she rounded the corner, she saw a large black figure pulling the branch of an ash tree down to its face, like it was examining the, the leaves on the tree. The good thing about this particular account is that Charmaine has um, a YouTube channel. And really? she's still very much local to that area. So she's actually got a video on her YouTube channel. When you just check her out, her name is Charmaine Fraser, Fraser with an right. S. Um, she actually has a video on there where she shows a picture of the actual location with, I think it's her brother. I think it's her brother that's standing there. And you right. see the ash tree as well. So you're actually able to get a good sense of what she saw. Right. Um, so what she saw was a big black figure. Um, she remembers it was very tall, very wide, and pure black. Right. Which is something that we often hear about as well. There's not many creatures. That's pretty, yeah, pretty standard for a description, isn't it? Tall, yeah. you know, stocky, black, normally because of the fur colour. Absolutely. Yeah. So she stared, as I said, so for a second or two, she just stared at it. Um, like kids do, they don't doesn't quite register what they're seeing. And yeah. then she let out a scream. Once she did, um, it was almost like she startled it. Right. It like it, it, it flinched and then slowly turned around toward her, but she'd already taken off by that point. So she noted that it flinched when yeah. she screamed and started turning toward her, but she'd already headed back up to Grand's house. Yeah. Um, she's, she's crying. Which is the thing to do. <laughs> so, which is the sensible thing to do in that situation. Oh, yeah, yeah. Leg it. Yeah, don't run toward it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what idiots do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But, um, obviously screaming, there was a monster behind her. Um, and of course, being a child, no one believed the child. No. You know, oh, it's just one of the neighbours. She says, like, it's not, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, but she does actually have a second um, experience a number of years later. Wow. Again, on her way to her grand's house, a um, couple of hundred yards up from the turning to go to a, a, a nan's house, her grand's house, there's um, an entrance to a quarry. And in the middle of the road, near the entrance to the quarry, she says that she saw a large greyish figure standing in the middle of the road. And it was looking directly at the car as they were driving toward it hmm. before they turned left to go toward grand's but it had large glowing orange eyes. Grey, now, with, right, that's different. Yeah, so it's a little bit different with the grey. Yeah. Um, but this time with orange. large glowing, glowing orange eyes. Normally most um, accounts that we've obviously discussed prior to this is that it's normally glowing and red. Yeah. Because of obviously glowing the devilish eyes. evil eyes in the dark or in the distance. But for it to be grey and orange, that's, yeah. Well, this is this is something as well. The the the, the glowing eyes is a a correlating characteristic that we've already seen. I mean, we've we've looked at cryptids yeah. briefly across the world, and that yeah. seems to be something that connects them all, which I think is very very odd. In fact, that yeah. it's got red eyes, glowing eyes, or, yeah, glowing red eyes, glowing orange eyes yeah. in the darkness. If you've got a flashlight or something like that, then yeah, you get the little reflection off of the retina. Off the eye, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. But if it's glowing, if there's no light source coming toward it, I think that's very, very odd. Yeah, definitely. Um, what's also odd is it seems like no one else saw it. So she what, she with anyone in the car? Yeah. So she was well, right. she was only a couple of years later. So I'm guessing she was must have been about 10, 11, something like that. So she would have right. been in the back seat of the car. Yeah. And then she's driving forward, or they are driving forward, she notices it. And as they go around, she continues to see it. Now, it wasn't, it didn't actually occur to her as to what she saw until years later when she saw a Bigfoot documentary. And then she decided, wow. right, I'm going to look into um, yeah. UK Bigfoot sightings and such. And that's when she decided for herself that that was a very, yeah. very strange occurrence. Um, but that's that's what... I find odd is that no one else saw it. It was just her. That is quite, yeah. Especially because you also you would have imagined that the driver and the front passenger before anyone would have seen something up ahead 
especially if you're driving, you know, right at it. So, it's, yeah, it's quite quite telling, really. That, But then again, you sort of think, again, it's one of those things that she saw something in the woods at a younger age. You know, their imaginations are more vivid, you know, untarnished by the, you know, sort of the real world. So has she sort of built that up in her mind? So and then only a couple of years later... Sitting on her mind. Yeah, it's like a suppressed memory. And because they're back in that area... She just so happens to be staring off into the distance, bit of a daydream, not really thinking much of it, and just pictures that same, that you know, that that same sort of figure off in the distance. But it's different. Because, it's, it's interesting, sorry, because back when she was six or seven, she she recalls that it was a, a black figure, mm. whereas this time she's saying it's that black. it was grey. So is there a difference in time? Like was it at night before, and this was during the day? So is that well contributed to it, or well? It depends, really, doesn't it? I mean, I would have thought that the, the first experience that she had would have been morning time because she was off to go and get the newspapers. Yeah, so I imagine so. Do the morning walk with the dog, go and get yeah. the paper, head, head yeah. back. It doesn't say what sort of time the second experience was or what time of day it was, only that it was a couple of years later and it was in right. the same area. Same spot, yeah. Yeah. There's, um, okay. That's interesting. There's also there's, there's a, um, another fella around about that sort of area and his name was Mark Fraser now, it seems like there's no actual relation there they just happen to have the same last name but Mark yeah. Fraser is a cryptozoologist and he's done lots of um, investigations in and around the Angus area but these ones actually come from the Torfins which is in Aberdeenshire so a right. little bit further north, and this is around about the mid 90s so okay. a little bit later um, compared to Charmaine's stories um, but this does have a connection. Okay. Um, this contains several incidents of the 90s and reported red glowing eyes again. So it's yeah, the red yeah. glowing eyes. That the old glowing eyes are back, are yeah. In the British Bigfoot wild man cases. Yeah. There's not much in the way of um, physical evidence, but there's lots of this glowing eyes, whether they're orange, yellow or red, um, uh, they've got, I've got qu I've got a few of them that have come up that I think are, are quite poignant. Um, but alongside his investigations, there was the usual stuff of wood breaks, whooping in the woods, um, running as they're running back to the car, they can hear the footsteps behind them. There's all that yeah. horror movie yeah. style accounts that you would expect to to hear from a Bigfoot, but it does follow those red glowing eyes. Which would take yeah. me into the paranormal aspect of it all. And it didn't uh, take long to do that with the British cases. It right, really... That's surprising. I mean, because... it's Yeah, it's, it wasn't in every account that I read that they kind of speculated or, or kind of took it towards the whole paranormal element. It's all very much, it's a creature, it lives out here, we're going to hunt it and kill it. That That's very much, certainly from the Pacific Northwest, you know, sort of American side, you know, that's very much um, kind of what the idea was. The Canadians and their Sasquatch, it was more preserve it, you know, leave it be, but kind of find out how long it's been here and kind of what it wants type thing. I didn't really, well, yeah, I didn't really find... With the flesh and blood thing, really. That's why I wanted to do that. Um, but Yeah, I didn't really find anything... It almost instantly took me down the paranormal sort of thing. And yeah. I did get thinking, I did get like into the thinking of it all. Like, could a creature like that actually exist in the British Isles? And it is a possibility. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I guess it, it comes back it, to that Gigantopithecus again, doesn't it? Yeah. In well, the sense that if there's um, remains of that over here, and it seems like either there was or it was certainly close in, in parts of Europe, then there's no reason to suggest that something of that nature could live, you know, could could live here. But then, you know, once we get into the paranormal, then there are other ways that a creature like that could travel. So that just opens up a whole, well, it, it a whole seemed, other sort of element. It seemed like as well um, the, the creature of uh, Gigantopithecus seemed to be more at home in the lowlands yeah where okay. it where, wherever it is that it came from it wasn't a mountainous creature no so this that's why i got because it was like somerset um kind of you know dartmouth you know the moors 
around the sort of southwest of the country. And that's all, I mean, it's hilly, but it's relatively it's flat, flat in comparison. And it's a lot of, not many, not much woodland for the most part. And until you get into like the national parks or national that's forests why I and stuff. To bring up Doggerland, because yeah. now Doggerland is completely submerged, it would yeah. have been lowland. So yeah. if there was ever a population of them, then that's where they would have been. It, that's where it would have been. It would have been around that area or it would have been around the Netherlands or something like that. If we, I've, if we are ever going to find um, fossilized remains of a, a great ape like Gigantopithecus in Europe, I think that's where it would be. That's where it would be. Yeah. Because I mean, there's not, a, apart from around the Mediterranean and such, there wasn't much in the way of lowlands, especially 10 to 12,000 years ago, or even 20,000 years ago. Um, because okay. the sea levels were up three to 400 feet lower. Um, also talking about the practical practicality side of it all, about are these creatures, if they are flesh and blood, are they able to sustain themselves hmm. on the British Isles? Are they able to find habitat as well? I mean, we've got you've got, my, you've got to say yes you? everywhere that we haven't even experienced. I mean, there's a lot of abandoned mines now. There's no, there's no real mining going on. In no, not future. anymore. A lot of them have just been sealed up at sort of ground level. So there's still a lot going on beneath the ground that we, yeah, that we don't even know. You know, there's cave systems and you know that could lead into that or away from it. You know, there's there's so much that you know. Well, there is such an, an underground system that, that you know that could be you know in existence and we and we don't even you know we don't even know no no we have, we have no idea really it's that, that this is the thing i mean the, the one thing i do want to say with regards to the possibility of it being able to live and to travel through the cave systems is we just don't actually know about the cave systems no. There's loads of them. There's, there's. I mean, apparently, according to some geologists, we've up in the UK, um, we have only discovered, based on general mathematics and, mm. and predictability of where cave systems would prop up, yeah. we've only discovered about twenty five percent of them across the UK. I think I'll, right. That and can certainly come into play when you question, you know why a, a you know a bigfoot den has never been found or and also you've got like to ask yourself is whether or not it's a migratory creature or does it, it just follow the seasons migrate? or the food yeah does it follow the food does it migrate with the food you know it depends you know i mean you could understand that it being in the moors and in dartmouth and that kind of that kind of place you know maybe even to like the new forest and that because you've got you know you know deer populations and you know sheep while you know wild sheep that kind of thing so if they feed on that type of thing then that's in the relative abundance in those types of areas you know if it's going to be up in sort of scotland and the highlands and that then you're going to have streams and fish and and that that kind of thing i don't i can't really i mean I could, and i could be wrong in this because my geography for the most part is quite poor but i don't think we've got any landscape that's anything close to the pacific northwest which is where you get a lot of the main you know bigfoot you know stories so yeah as you say do we have the type of habitat that could sustain a creature like that i think for the most part yes depending on whether it eats vegetation or you know fish or you know other you know sort of smaller animals you know there is the woodland but it's very concentrated so it's not going to be out and about all that often so yeah as you say does it make benefit of the unused or unknown cave systems well it could even it could even um benefit from green roads you know what 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 are called green roads which are off of the beaten track yeah exactly yeah if we had, plenty of those if we had the stomach for it we could move around the whole uk i could get from here to edinburgh if i had the stomach for it <laughs> yeah unseen yeah that means crossing rivers that means getting through brambles and everything else and absolutely yeah. the same way that wild animals would yeah so it is possible but, just changing the subject, but that's why I always think on that hunted program on Channel Four, yeah. why everyone gets caught so friggin' easily. Because you just think like you've got so well, much space and woodland, and that's your advantage. Why the hell are you getting caught? I and mean, easier said than done, I'm sure. But I do look at it and think, well, surely there's easier ways of just not getting found. <laughs> like not using a credit card, turning off your phone, yeah. 
and just go in Neanderthal with it, I guess, to, you know, yeah. to an extent. Yeah, you know, I mean, a lot of us don't have the stomach for it. We don't have the stomach to, to, to try. You know, I mean, I wouldn't. I'd, and I'm not sitting here saying that I'd be able to do it, you no, know, as easy either. as that. But put in that situation where you'd have to do it, it's fight or flight, isn't it? I suppose none of us really know whether we would be able to or not. But if you're adapted to that, then if you're adapted it's already, yeah, certainly a possibility. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, definitely. The, even I mean, you get some of the those that are involved with the BBR. They estimate the numbers of Bigfoot in the UK based on the amount of sightings that have been around across the entire um, UK to be anywhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred. So wow. looking just you know not quite huge amounts of it yeah. but they believe that that's about the same sort of numbers for big cats yeah true that they reckon they're making a comeback into the british wilderness uh, wilderness sorry don't they big cats Since and pumas and... it was the dangerous animal act wasn't it yeah you, know, you couldn't own a dangerous animal like a panther or a, yeah. a leopard or something like that so they just <laughs> let them out the door go, oh, go you on know, off you go yeah. like, oh, and that's why there's they became know, wild they, didn't they yeah they sort of big cats in Britain. And it is, it is a real thing. It is real documented cases. They've been observed. Um, apart from the odd one that they believe was a big cat, turns out it was just a tomcat. Uh, you know, it, <laughs> not, 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 it genuinely happened. Well, there was, tomcat. Remember, there was um, in Colchester, around the Colchester area, someone oh. had a stuffed tiger that they put in the middle of a field and they were getting real reports of a tiger that had been escaped from <laughs> Colchester Zoo. And it turns out it was just a big stuffed tie guy. That's little, perfect. I love that. Just lying Someone down. just up for shits and giggles and just like, you know that stuffed tie you've had in the loft for 20 years? Put it in the field. Do you fancy having some fun? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this goes wouldn't? viral. That's, you know, yeah, let's be honest, that's... who wouldn't? Yeah. Exactly. But, see the that also, but no, that's intriguing though, man. That yeah, also like... adds credence to how easy people can be deceived as well. Yes, definitely. Um, how, well, how quick they are to believe stuff as well. Oh, yeah, there's a... That's, I think I did say this before we started recording, but there is a certain type of person that dedicates all their time to researching Bigfoot. Yeah. And that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really, because I don't want to get nasty. I don't want to say bad things or anything no, like no. that. But there is a certain type of person yeah. that dedicates all their time to researching yeah. Bigfoot. Um, and we're going to join them, I think. We, I've, I've, I think I'm already there. I think, yeah. I've joined the fan club. I'm just waiting for my card to come through. <laughs> we have a membership card. So. I've got a bumper sticker and a, and a hat. I've just not worn it yet. Honk at me if you love Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah. Honk if you like it big. <laughs> <laughs> the difficulty of the, the Bigfoot stuff yeah. in Britain. Because there were so many stories of high strangeness. And I'll use that particular term. The high strangeness stuff because and to try and differentiate that from like dog man sightings or werewolf sightings yeah. it was very very difficult to do that with the uk stuff it gives us plenty of material for later on for this particular episode it was quite difficult to kind of find the right angle on it without going yeah. down the the batshit crazy sort of stuff you know, oh yeah I mean, you could go down either you could go down the fully kind of paranormal you know route you could go down the full so you know this is a creature and we're going to hunt it and kill it route you know, you know, the, 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 or you could go down the, you know, the the hoax route, or mm. or not so much hoax, but you know, stories that have been influenced by actual things. So there's always an explanation as to why, you know, something happened. So it, you know, yeah. and whole belief systems have been based on what these groups believe to be a creature that lives in the wild wilderness. Yet mm. there are counter tales or counter, you know, legends yeah. that kind of add a little bit more realism to it where you think oh actually that's kind of what they so it was true to the people that experienced it at the time mm. in much like the fred beck um encounter yeah. the ape canyon one so it was, it was real to them at the time but it was only years later when people have actually dived into it and thought right well let's actually find out what happened that other accounts come out of the woodwork or other evidence and so you're then able to sort of piece it together and that's why yeah. i say like at a point i had to stop yeah because my watch list on amazon was just getting ridiculous and it was all just Bigfoot documentaries. I mean, amount of times, you know, much of a muchness, isn't it? It's much of it is. That's the thing. It gets to a point where it is much of a muchness. It's the same story just told in a different way in a different part of America or, 
you know, the same legend, but with a slightly different spin in the Himalayas. Or So you've just got to watch as much as you can stomach, really, you know, collate, you know, your thoughts and, you know, and your beliefs, you know, from that and, and kind of, you know, and kind of go from there, really. And it's one of those things that until you actually experience it yourself or have your own account to work from, you've really got, you know, just word of mouth or other people's exactly stories it. to kind of, you know, to kind of believe. You could go down, you know, the flesh and blood, this is actually a creature type route. Mm. You could go down the paranormal type route. You know, you could even go down, um, you know, the, the sort of the more hoax or, you know, uh, sort of yeah. made up route. So you've got at least those three different, you know, yeah, kind of right, yeah. avenues. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, but that was probably, I mean, that yeah. was in one of the, I think I was in the last episode of the uh, Bigfoot Files documentary that I watched. Gotcha. They had three parts. Uh, the first one, they were in the Pacific Northwest. The second one was when I think they went to the uh, the Himalayas, because mm-hmm. there's a story about a, a Nazi SS soldier who shot what he believed was a Yeti. They captured it, stuffed it, and it's in a museum still in that region now. Well, that would have made sense as well, because... Um until after the second world war no one was allowed in tibet other than tibetans yeah they didn't allow it and the only ones that they did allow in were nazis well, yeah probably because they didn't have any choice <laughs> our um, first our first episode yeah. and we've already mentioned nazis <laughs> exactly yeah already um and yeah and so i don't know which creature this was specifically but obviously they found that he didn't actually shoot a yeti or a bigfoot i think it was actually a black bear Right. Well, because of where because of where they were in the Himalayas, it obviously might have had snow on its fur or whatever, which gave it the white colouring, which is why bigger. they panicked, shot it, stuffed it and everything else. But yeah, but yeah, but, but this was the episode where they, they found that from all the uh, Pacific Northwest and um and uh Himalayan stories that the hair traces were from either a black bear, um a cow, a deer, a dog a raccoon, and the most surprising one was a porcupine. A porcupine? Which I thought, which I thought had needles coming out of them. Yeah. So I don't know where they would have got yeah, hair from, well. but I guess they must have fur somewhere. But, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was, yeah, so I thought that mm. was, yeah, that was, that was weird. So, that, yeah, that, that, that adds to the, the idea that that was a hoax. The fact that you've got all of those. Yeah, the Nazi um, one was a hoax, hoax yeah. Well, porcupine up in the Himalayas. Again, it wasn't a hoax. I mean, I think the, the Nazi one, I think, was a black bear that they shot. But again, that, that just leads to the the sort of theory that I said about, you know, it's it's not a hoax. At the time, they fully believed it to be true. That's what they thought it was. It's just in later years when they've had the technology, they've actually been able to go back and debunk it or prove it. You've got to be careful what you watch because some of it is good and some of it is just... So if you if you have the misfortune of watching your first one, which is absolute shite, that will turn you off the whole legend of Bigfoot straight away. Whereas if you watch yeah. some of the good ones which are the ones the, th- the three that i watched well the the three of the best ones that i watched the ones that i just mentioned we can mm. share links somewhere for anyone who yeah. may want to jump in um but yeah as you say you, you can get caught up in watching absolute nonsense and it is much of a muchness and so you've got to be careful but the thing that's so frustrating about the bigfoot stuff mm. is there's so many stories and there's yeah. such little evidence and the people that come forward yeah. with like we, like we were talking about the guy that that um, it ended up being just a black bear or the, yeah. the SS officer that, that shot something. Shot a black up, bear, yeah. And it had bear, dog, porcupine. It, it was just like, what? Oh, what it was a that? whole like farmyard of different animals, yeah. which we find exactly. you know, in almost time. everyday life. Someone's just put that sample together. But they were just you know? convinced at the time that what they'd shot or what they'd seen was of a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch or a Masty or whatever you want to call it, you know. It's... Which makes me think, and I know you think this as well, <laughs> it's not wholly no. a physical being. No. It's not wholly flesh and blood. That's definitely, I mean, I just, just we before we get, get yeah, I mean, just before we get into that bit, I just want, because mm. I know if you're a sceptic like I may have been, you know, in, in sort of previous years, there are certain questions that I know, you know, would be, you know, would be asked. And I just wanted to kind of go over them just to sort of add some kind of um, yeah, yeah, go sort of context to it, really. And this is what I thought was good about the documentary that was called uh, Don't Call Me Bigfoot. It was um, 
they basically said, these are all the sceptic questions that I imagine you would have, and this is my answer to them, sort of thing. And so the first one would be, you know, why has there never been any corpses found? Why has a, a dead Bigfoot never, never been found? And he said, you know, animals don't want to die in the open mm. like no one would, you know. So they would just, you know, if they got ripped apart by another animal or they got shot or bro broke a leg or whatever, they would basically just look for the most secluded area that they could or the most enclosed area that they could away from prying eyes, you know, from other predators because they don't want to get ripped to pieces mm. by other predators whilst they're slowly dying or, you know, once they have died. So like any animal, they would look for a secluded spot. They would hide and just, you know, die on their own sort of thing yeah. in the hope that they wouldn't get found. And that other, like I say, other predators wouldn't find their body and, you know, and tear it, oh, tear it to pieces. If they want to be found. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If they want to be found, they'll make themselves known. And if they don't, then, you yeah, know, they'll, 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 they'll hide. Same with, like with foxes, like badgers. You always see the damage that a badger does. You never, you never see one unless it's roadkill. Yeah. You know, and, and unfortunately in that incident, it doesn't always have the time to crawl away to a secluded spot to, you know, die so it's not getting trampled by cars. Um, the other thing they said as well is that obviously in like the Pacific Northwest and these heavily dense woodland areas is that the soil is very acidic. So bones would decompose far quicker than if it was just in a normal field or out on the path or yeah. you know in normal un like uh, undergrowth so there's a lot of they would decompose a lot quicker and that's assuming there's anything left once scavengers had picked it apart and you know whatever else so i found that was i mean it was a very convenient excuse but i think the science backs it up like because those things do happen so yeah, it does work you've I mean, got to sort of believe it you know sort of to an extent and the other thing again was with the uh you know why have they not found any fossilized remains of a bigfoot considering it's been hundreds and hundreds of years that stories have, you know, started creeping up the woodwork. Mm. Um, and that is where they, the scientists again said, you know, you have to have the absolute best conditions for um, fossils to be made. You said you have to have, it has to be the right temperature. You said the ground compression has to be absolutely perfect. The soil conditions and the type of soil have to be absolutely perfect. Is that, like, you know, that's why it's taken us so long to find dinosaur bones because you're having to dig through the layers and layers and layers of earth and soil. Bones, it's just rock. Yeah. That's how like for millions and millions of years. Yeah. But, but you're right. You're hundred percent right there for stuff to be preserved. It has to meet very, very small criteria. Oh, such a tight criteria that, and he said in most places in the world where you would associate the Bigfoot, you don't get each, you might get one of the conditions like tick, mm but you're not going to get all four or five of the conditions that you need to create one. So, and all you need is one to fall out mm. and you're not going to get a fossil. But so, we've already established as well that a Bigfoot like creature once existed. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Southeast Asia. It was the Gigantopithecus. Exactly. So yeah. Yeah. A creature like that has existed in the past. It just exactly. that hasn't existed in North America. So yeah, I reckon we've, we've covered sort of both of those uh, angles with it really. I think the, um, the last one to kind of touch upon um, is, yeah, is the the paranormal side and how Bigfoot owes itself to to a lot of those uh, sort of theories. Um, yeah. I guess to start off, sort of relatively small because I know it, it isn't directly about Bigfoot. But I know we've both watched um, a couple of documentaries. Um, I think also on um, Amazon Prime um, called "The Missing." Um, yes, the missing four one one. There's a theory that. Bigfoot isn't necessarily a flesh and blood creature. It's a, a, a spiritual being or uh, interdimensional creature. So yes. by that, obviously, we mean that they can walk in and out of multiple dimensions using a put like a portal system. I well, guess the, the understanding is, and it's only a couple of weeks ago that um, scientists discovered um, an alternate dimension. Yes, yeah. they actually did actually <laughs> discover yeah. it. I can't. It was it was a uh, an article that was published on a Science Journal or something like that. Yeah. That I read through and it. They said that they discovered yeah. an alternate dimension. Yeah, which, which is, is just nuts. Which is just the, the start of it all, really. Which kind of again adds kind of a bit of weight to the precursor to science fact. Yet again. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and it adds a bit of weight to you know what we're talking about here. And, and yeah, again, the reason why I mentioned that documentary, it doesn't mention Bigfoot as a theory or anything at all. 
But mm. when you what when you watch all this Bigfoot stuff and you hear about some of the things that happen, and then I just I just thought about that documentary and I just thought, you know what, like there's something they tried to think of animals that were indigenous to that area and animals that could pick up a three year old boy undetected, carry it two thousand feet, and then and then kind of do whatever. There is a correlation between Bigfoot sightings and UFO sightings. Yeah. Um, and that is not just um, a North American phenomena. No. That's also something that discovered when I was looking at the British stuff is that there is a map that details all the various different high strangeness. So that yeah. is everything from Bigfoot to werewolves to dogman, pig man, like I mentioned earlier, yeah. UFOs, yeah, yeah. cats, everything everything all yeah, stuff yeah. is my strangeness and they all have little pockets all over the place and when you lay that map over the national grid power line map yeah it matches up as well that's something that's odd as well so it's high it's levels of high um, magnetic power. electric electric energy absolutely yeah. it's high strangeness now obviously there's things that people actually attribute to that is that electromagnetic waves and such can actually have a, a um, what do they call it? It's like a hallucinating effect. Sort of effect yeah, on hallucinogenic, that's right, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm no scientist or anything like that, but I don't know. I'm not, uh, maybe it's my own bias. It's definitely a theory. We can't. I think there's more to it than just. Well, again, because, yeah, the other thing would be, is if that's right, and I'm sure it is, again, I'm not a scientist either, so I can't disprove it, but everyone would surely have their own hallucination. So there'd be a lot of accounts of different things being spotted. So if, if, it, if, if that was the case, and I'm, you know, I'm sure it is, why would everyone see the same thing? Because surely when you hallucinate, you would see uh, something yes, that your own mind has built up. Or... No, group hallucinations, they, they, they can't answer. Yeah. There, there, there are people, psychologists and scientists that do try to answer a group hallucination. Yeah. But they they can't come up with anything solid. Um, there yeah. is a particular condition that happens apparently. There's probably something um, that they'll find in someone's DNA or in someone's mindset that a certain type of person is connected to one another, and when they step foot in this highly electrical field, that they're somehow connected and they may be sharing that hallucination or sharing that sighting, but interpreting it in their own way. Which again, I guess, falls into like the simulation theory, um, which yes. we're definitely not going to definitely not going to get into now. <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> but again, that could, you know, that could then you know slip into that that you know, like a, a checkpoint in a computer game or something. You know, yeah. you step on yeah. a certain you step on a certain spot or drive over a certain threshold, and you're you're in that part of the simulation, but only you can see what you're seeing because no one else has travelled there yet or someone else isn't susceptible to it that kind of thing what if they're screen memories what if it's something Mm. that's been implanted in your head and now this is where i think we might actually genuinely genuinely lose lose people yeah please keep listening if you you are (laughs) if the glowing red eyes yeah are an indication of a screen memory what so something that's been planted in your mind to see at that particular point or something that's been planted in that particular point for you to see? First, I believe believe that someone might have seen something and their mind has been manipulated to see something else. So where you and I have discussed the idea of the... Well, I said that to you, didn't I? I said that, sorry, just to cut in, but with the Bigfoot thing um, and my sort of theory is that it's a, a, a being a spiritual being, interdimensional being that's travelled to Earth or to our world, however you want to see our simulation, whatever, and it's picked an identification that it believes that we will feel more uh, comfortable with or more at home with. So what we're actually looking at is different, and it could be, I don't know, a, you know, a grey man or a little yeah. green man or whatever, but we're, we've been fine-tuned or programmed so we're looking at one entity but it's bouncing back an image that it knows yeah. that we'll recognize or we'll be able to put some sort of reasoning to as opposed to what it is we're actually looking at mm-hmm. and that's why that's why for the most part spoiler alert 
believe um, that Bigfoot probably is. Interdimensional. Yeah, pretty much. But more on the spiritual side of things. I don't know. I don't know that that bit's uh, it's definitely interdimensional. I think, but I don't know in terms of its, you know, as an entity whether it's actually flesh and bones, or whether it's more a passing like being between. Sort of thing. Yeah, like but no. But yeah, sorry to cut in. This is obviously the wilder theory out of the three that we've that we've mm-hmm. probably covered. It's for whatever reason, it's the one that I feel more akin to believing, which may surprise some listeners, depending on who's listening. But it me I know it surprised you when I first I mentioned you it. For a while. It's, I know it surprised you when I first mentioned it that that yeah. was kind of my my way. Because I know we've spoken about many, you know, conspiracies and many cryptids and that kind of thing. I normally have quite a kind of I tend to have quite a, a sort of black and white, hard and fast kind of nah, bollocks, or yeah, you know, this is rubbish because or whatever. I, and when I see it. Yeah, exactly. I'll believe it when I see it. That's very much my kind of mantra. But with this, and, and this has been a consequence of the, you know, the deep dive and watching various documentaries and, you know, and also and listening to what's another podcast, which I guess we can name drop um, yeah. our friends at Not Another Conspiracy podcast, which uh, haven't gone into the cryptid side, literally more of the conspiracy theory side. But this whole simulation thing came up and when you sort of look into that and the possibilities of that and how these, you know, Bigfoot creatures, you know, travel and what their purpose is and, you know, kind of what they lend themselves to and also the connection to UFOs. I think yeah. there's a lot of, you know, you can, you can sort of plan the dots and, you know, they'll all sort of, you know, they'll all sort of meet up um, in some going ways. down these rabbit holes though. If anyone that has actually genuinely looked into these things, when you start going down these rabbit holes, you find connections with everything. everything. And it's, it's, everything. You have, like, what we, like what you were saying at the beginning, you have to stop yourself, take a step back and find your center again. And you then, do, because you can back. get led down the garden path with a certain thing. Like if you was to look at the, um, you know, the simulation theory, or if you used to look at the paranormal side of things, yeah. If you go go down into it deep enough, you could quite easily fall into that, you know, I guess what I'll call Absolutely. trap, inverted commas, um, and fully believe that that's what, that's what it is. Or you could go down the whole hoax avenue and believe a lot of the naysayers and believe that it's just all bollocks and it's just something that we want to believe in because our lives are that miserable and pointless that we need something to believe in. Or you could go down the science route and believe that it's... Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Or you could go down the science route and, you know, it could be an early Neanderthal that's just survived over the years, yeah, or it could be a descendant that of... That has its downfalls as well. It does have its downfalls, you know, or it could be a descendant of Gigantopithecus, which is easily explained. So, you know, you've got these various avenues, and I'd like to think that despite my own theory, that I have for the most part, stayed mm. fairly level-headed because I've taken all the arguments, I've taken all the routes that you could go down. Yeah. And whether it's because I want to believe it or whether it's because I feel it's the most compelling, yeah. I, I don't know what the reason is, but certainly the, the paranormal, interdimensional um, theory is the one that I'm feeling more inclined to believe for, for a lot of reasons, most of which we've gone over you know, in, in this episode. I want to just go over a quick account before we wrap up. Yeah, and it's sure. one that you actually pointed me in the direction of. Um, ah, yes. And now yeah. this kind of lends into my, theory. yeah, this lends into my <laughs> theory and my sort of belief system when it comes to the Bigfoot. Um, and it is quite easily my favourite account of a Bigfoot slash uh, Sasquatch. Um, not only is it the most imaginative um, that I've ever heard, um, comes courtesy of uh, the Witch Bitch Amateur Hour, which is uh, another mm-hmm. podcast out yeah, there. Nice. Um, that dives into a lot of this type of stuff, to be honest. You know, we're not doing anything original or different. It does dive into a lot of these sort of stories. Some of them seem to be quite localised to their area or to the United States. Um, But this was one that I heard at the end of one of their episodes, and I loved it. As soon as I heard it, I was just like, yeah, this is is a bit of me. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, So the story itself was sent into the girls at the, the witch bitch uh, amateur hour podcast. And it was sent in by a lady named uh, Bridget who to her own admission was writing in from bumfuck nowhere, Oklahoma, <laughs> which me and Scott discussed this before is quite easily my favorite description of anywhere <laughs> ever. 
So um, I'm going to steal it on numerous occasions. So thank you, Bridget, for that first off. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, so basically the story goes that Bridget and her friends were doing a Ouija board um, to try and connect with a Bigfoot to, or the spirit of a Bigfoot to ask whether it was real or not. Now, mm. Bridget connected with her spirit guide. Apparently, we all have one. And in, in asking the question, is Bigfoot real? Bridget's spirit guide answered, yes, of course. Now, the spirit guide was able to connect with a Bigfoot themselves and basically relay back to Bridget and her friends the following information. And again, if this is all nonsense, then it's the most brilliant nonsense I've heard in a, in a long time. And it's so imaginative that if nothing else, you've got to applaud it. Mm. But this is what they found out via her spirit guide talking to the, the Bigfoot. They don't actually like being called Bigfoot. That's not a, a, a name. That, that's not a name that they would, uh, you know, a nickname that they would pick for them themselves. <laughs> um, much like us, they have different, you know, nationalities or, or, or species or you know types of that creature. Um, now they say that the the brown ones, which are the ones that I think are more synonymous with the Pacific Northwest and mm -hmm. possibly the UK, are known as years. I believe is what she said. And the right, the white ones, which I guess would be the Yeti, so you know the Asia and, and the Himalayas, would be called the Yed, Y E D, um, which I thought was, I mean, just to think of that alone, I think it's pretty genius. Um, now, they st and this obviously ties into my, I believe, our belief, um, but they study us as as humans, which is why they try to stay as undetected as as possible and they travel between dimensions uh, to do that so they'll pop up in different areas you know to taste you know the local sort of food to examine us watch our behaviors and, and kind of see what we do which i guess ties into your scotland story um scott about examining the ash tree yeah. stuff examining that finding out what it was that kind of thing now there is more than one uh they have a small population of around forty thousand. Uh, this is all from the actual spirit guide. Um, and one, th one specific thing they mentioned, which was that they don't understand our religion or our religions. They don't understand the belief system, why we follow it, mm -hmm. you know, what substance it has and, and all that kind of thing, which I thought was quite intriguing, actually. Yeah. Um, us do either, really. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. um, they come to our planet to um, collect uh, stones and... Um, like herbs basically so when you see them foraging in in woodland it's because they're picking up you know sort of wild herbs flowers edible plants that type of thing and on also stones presumably to take back to their dimension to build their own habitats and stuff there's so also, there's also um uh, like the whole blair witch uh, stone piles and stuff like that yes that yeah the stone piles the um the crosses and stuff now apparently it's the, the trees that are put into like sort of crosses and stuff, a bit of a mixed opinion as to what people believe they are, but most people believe that they are a marker for other Bigfoots. So they know where they've been. So they don't need to kind of explore that area, but it's also to fend off humans and other predators from walking around, you know, or being in around that, that area. I like to believe both. I think both are quite cool really. Um, but yeah, that certainly ties in with, yeah, why they take and move, you know, sort of stones um mm. most of the time they do cloak themselves from us um to obviously prevent being seen um and to move around i guess freely so a lot of the footage that we've discussed could be where they've dropped their their cloak they've dropped their shield mm. unknowing that there are humans around to spot them or i suppose it, it could they be they just didn't care enough it could be it could be like biological sort of camouflage in the way the same way that um yeah cuttlefish squids and octopus change yeah color could be that shape. maybe it's yeah. between a change in in shield or a, a change in cloaking that they were spotted and that's how they were seen and that's why they dart away so quickly and then inevitably disappear that's into thin air it. because they realize that they've got their cloak or shielding off i do i, I do like to quite you know be believe that predator in like a literal yeah thing and, that uh, over them and 
in this next bit of info, which I know you'll hear in almost any Bigfoot account, is the howl or the the screech, the the noise that is that's been made synonymous with Bigfoot. Um, apparently, they do that mostly to scare people away or other predators. People have sort of said that it's it's talking between one another. Yeah. Um, from what I gather from this account, though, is that they travel singularly. They don't travel in groups. So when you hear those accounts of, you know, a, a, you know, a, a mummy and daddy Bigfoot and 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 younglings or cubs or whatever, for, uh, going by this account, that could be nonsense because they travel alone. Yeah. Um, and so the howling is done purely to, you know, scare well, scare way, people away. The accounts are solos aren't they? Yes, they are. Yeah. So thanks to um, Bridget and uh, the girls at the Witch Bitch Amateur Owl podcast for that, because that's but that's but I have everything that I've watched and the hours that I've spent deep diving into Bigfoot. That's probably by far the best and, and not compelling, but certainly most intriguing it's account favorite, of it, any yeah. of any Bigfoot. And I, I think it's probably because it lends itself to my own belief and theory. But also, because I just think it's awesome if it's true that someone's done a Ouija board or a spirit <laughs> box or whatever, and actually spoken to their spirit guide who's communicated in some way with a Bigfoot. I think that's just awesome, yeah, <laughs> whether you choose to believe yeah. it or not. I think as a as a, again as a as a you know a wannabe writer, just the fact that someone's thought of that and then sent it in as a possible encounter, I, I, I'm I I'm that. sold on that one. Yeah, I, I, I love that one. I think and at this it's, point, it's probably quite a good place to kind of sign off and, and kind of end it there. But yeah, hopefully you've stuck with it. Hopefully, you're, you know, you're still listening and uh, making up your own mind. More importantly, you know, we're not here to preach or convince you I otherwise. You really, really do hope they've heard our batshit mental theory. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. Because <laughs> I want this is the bit I want people to write in about. Challenge us. Yeah agree with us give us your own theories you know if you've had your own sightings give us your own sightings like just go nuts with it have as much fun with it as we've had yeah, um absolutely. and uh yeah and hopefully you've listened hopefully you'll you know you'll communicate and let us know what you think there will be more no doubt um i certainly our hope aim, there will our be aim is to change your mind it's no it's not it's to change your mind it's just or to preach it's just to kind of bring to you our theory, how we've got to that theory, our evidence, uh, oh, whether it's man. believable or not, um, <laughs> you know, others' research and, and just kind of let you make up your own conclusion. You might have started it thinking it was nonsense and you might end it thinking it was nonsense. We might have changed your mind at some point or or just added uh, weight uh, to your own belief. Fun nonsense. Or just, uh, yeah, just nonsense yeah. in general, yeah. But, um, but I think we will do a, a second episode we've not discussed it yet but i think i've already got the the subject in mind that i'd want to um cover but we'll discuss that, we off shall discuss that. and uh yeah. and hopefully come back with uh, with that in the next uh yeah next sort of couple of weeks but um but no yeah. as, as we said at the beginning I've, I've been callum and this has been scott this has been episode one of cryptid rambler podcast and uh yeah i hope you've enjoyed and uh thank you for viewing Thank you for viewing, for listening, and uh, speak to you soon.